proceed. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. And may it please the Court, Adam Landis from Landis, Rath & Cobb on behalf of FDX Trading Limited and its affiliated debtors. Your Honor, we're back on the agenda to finish up what we started yesterday in connection with numbers 7 and 9. I can report to you, Your Honor, that the parties last night did have conversations with respect to the JPL's lift stay or request that the stay doesn't apply. There has been no resolution or narrowing of issues sufficient for you not to rule. So the parties would request that you go ahead and rule. We don't know if you'd like to go ahead with items 7 and 9 first or if Your Honor would like to. Let's finish up the agenda and then we'll come back to it. Okay. Fantastic. So then we can resume where we were with the sealing order. Okay. Morning, Your Honor. Morning. Isaac Sasson for the Official Committee of Unsecured Creditors on the sealing motion. Your Honor, I think where we left yesterday, we were going to call our second witness this morning, Mr. Jeremy Sheridan. With your permission, we'd like to do that. Okay. Mr. Sheridan, come forward. Please take a stand and remain standing for the oath. Please raise your right hand. Please state your first name and spell your last name for the court record, please. My name is Jeremy Sheridan, last name S-H-E-R-I-D-A-N. Do you affirm that you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the best of your knowledge and abilities? I do. You may be seated. Your Honor. May I proceed? Thank you, Your Honor. As a preview, Mr. Sheridan filed a declaration in support of the sealing motion at docket number 1325. We'd like to admit that declaration as his direct testimony and supplement it with a brief direct as well this morning. My understanding is there are no objections, though the parties reserve the right to cross Mr. Sheridan. Okay. Is there any objection to the entry of the declaration? Your Honor, I do not object to the procedure of introducing the declaration, but there are two portions of it that I do have an objection to based on hearsay. Okay. Approach. Yep. I mean approach. Let me hear the, yes, the approach. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Juliet Sarkeesian on behalf of the U.S. Trustee. So in paragraph 18 of Mr. Sheridan's declaration, he has a discussion of what happened in the Celsius case, which then references certain documents that were filed. We do not object to the Celsius documents that were filed on the docket being admitted, but I do object to this witness is testifying about the contents because the contents speak for themselves, and I don't believe this gentleman has any involvement with personal knowledge of the Celsius case. Which joint exhibit is the declaration? Your Honor, it's not a joint exhibit. It's exhibit. It's exhibit I, and it's exhibit, it's at docket number 1578. Okay, I'm going to need a copy because I don't have it. May I approach? Yes. And which paragraph are you on now? Paragraph 18, Your Honor. Paragraph 18 of tab 1. Exhibit 18. Okay, and I'm sorry, is there your objection? What's the basis for the objection? My objection is, well, we do not object to the actual court filings in Celsius on this issue coming in. I do object to this gentleman's testimony about the contents, which speak for themselves, and I also don't believe Mr. Sheridan has any personal knowledge about what happened in Celsius, but 
If I'm wrong about that, I can be corrected. Your Honor, Mr. Sheridan is testifying in his expert capacity as to the general knowledge of what happened in the Celsius case. He's allowed to rely on the fact that it occurred and the strong supposition from that fact. I agree. Objection is overruled. The next one, Your Honor, relates to paragraph 21 of Mr. Sheridan's declaration. And this relates to the first two sentences, which, again, appear to be statements that are based on newspaper reports. Now, to the extent that it's based on his personal experience, and the last piece of the paragraph talks about his experience, and I do not object to that, but the first two sentences appear to be testimony based on what is in articles, newspaper articles, and we object to that as hearsay. Well, again, I think he's relying on that as an expert witness to inform his opinion, so I'll overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. And so the declaration is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. And just for housekeeping purposes, in terms of the exhibits to the declaration, we've spoken with counsel, and we're only seeking at this point to admit Exhibit A, which is Mr. Sheridan's CV, Exhibit I, which are the Celsius pleadings, and Exhibit J, the Celsius transcript. The rest of the exhibits are just reference to aid the reader in Mr. Sheridan's declaration. Okay. I just want to make it clear. You have to go to the microphone, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Katie Townsend on behalf of the media interveners. I just want to quick express that we, of course, reserve the right to rely on any of the exhibits that are relied on by Mr. Sheridan or attached to the declaration for impeachment purposes. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Your Honor, and with that, may I approach and hand Mr. Sheridan a copy of the declaration? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Sheridan. Good morning, sir. Mr. Sheridan, can you please describe briefly your educational background? My education, I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona in criminal justice, as well as a master's degree from the University of Arizona in public administration with a criminal justice emphasis. And do you have any specialty certifications? Yes, sir. As it relates to this matter, I am chain analysis reactor certified, which is the analytical tool for blockchain analysis developed by chain analysis. I have expert certifications from the Blockchain Council, which are cryptocurrency auditor, cryptocurrency expert, and blockchain expert. I have a certificate from Carnegie Mellon University for chief information security officer. I have a certificate from Columbia Business School executive education, blockchain for business. I am a certified information security manager through the Information Systems Audit and Control Association. I also have two certificates from the Global Information Assurance Corporation in information security governance and leadership. I think you mentioned that these relate to this matter. So all these certifications specifically relate to what sort of type of experience? Digital assets, blockchain, cryptocurrency, information security, and cybersecurity. And could you just please summarize your employment history since you graduated? Since I graduated from college, I spent a year as a juvenile corrections officer, four years as a police officer, 24 years with the United States Secret Service, one year as the vice president of regulatory affairs for a private digital asset infrastructure company, and the past three months with FDI consulting. And for everyone's benefit, what relation does the Secret Service have to cybercurrency, to cryptocurrency or cybercrime or just criminal investigations generally? The Secret Service has statutory authorization to conduct investigations into financial crimes of all types. As a result of that legal authority, as well as being one of two agencies listed in the, with specific statutory authority in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, us and the FBI, the Secret Service and the FBI, we are legally empowered to investigate financial crimes 
ranging from traditional financial crimes to uh, digital financial crimes. And at the Secret Service, did you work in that capacity in investigation of sub financial crimes? Yes, sir. Uh, throughout my 24-year career, 24 year career in a variety of capacities. And so do you have experience with investigating cyber-based crimes? Yes, sir. How long have you investigated cyber-based crimes? Um, during my 24 years uh, with the Secret Service, I spent uh, times in an investigative role. In total, it would be seven years uh, as a non-supervisory agent and then another seven years as a supervisory agent. And as part of your investigation of cyber-based crime, do you have any experience investigating crimes that relate to blo the blockchain or cryptocurrency generally? Yes, sir. And how much experience do you have there? Blockchain and digital assets would be approximately four years. And have you ever testified before? I've testified as an expert witness in front of the United States Congress on three separate occasions, uh, twice in front of the House of Representatives and once in front of the U.S. Senate. And what was the nature of that testimony? Those were related to uh, blockchain, digital asset, and cryptocurrency investigations. Thank you. And do you possess any security clearances? I have a top secret uh, SCI security clearance. And what institution granted you that clearance? Um, through the United States government, uh, I believe it's Department of Justice. Right. And I think I believe you have mentioned this earlier, but where are you currently employed? With FTI Consulting. And what is your title at FTI? I'm a managing director. And how long have you held that title? For three months. What are your day-to-day -day job responsibilities as managing director? So I lead our investigations uh, function within FTI, and in that capacity I lead teams of uh, blockchain and digital asset investigators, uh, forensic analysts, uh, consultants who engage in a variety of investigative capacities, everything from theft, fraud, scam, market valuation, uh, track and trace, and, and other functions related to digital assets. And in your capacity as advisor in FTI, have you become familiar with the facts of this case? Yes, sir. Right. So just moving on more generally, based on your experience investigating crimes and cyber crimes, do bad hackers typically target holders of cryptocurrency? Yes, sir. Why is that? Uh, I think Largely, it's due to the nature of the asset itself. Uh, cryptocurrency is extremely valuable. It is global and near instantaneous in its transfer. It is pseudo-anonymous, and the transactions are irreversible. So as a result, it provides opportunity for criminal actors as both means and method to execute criminal schemes. And do you have any direct experience with bad actors targeting holders of cryptocurrency? Yes, sir. And without going through everything that was said in your declaration, can you just br briefly summarize some of that experience? Yes, so in both my investigative role with the United States Secret Service, uh, in my private sector capacity in regulatory affairs, uh, specifically our customer base, as well as in my current role with FTI in investigative functions, uh, I have uh, led and been part of investigations that relate to the, the types of schemes I've outlined in my declaration. Uh, business email compromises that target cryptocurrency holders uh, by means of email communications purporting to be a legitimate business uh, communication, um, pig butchering where specific individuals are targeted based on their name and uh, fooled into investing cryptocurrency uh, in incremental ways in order to increase uh, the amount of uh, funds that will be taken from that individual. Romance scams where individuals are targeted and uh, lured into sending cryptocurrency to criminal actors. Phishing attempts where fraudulent emails, texts, or other communications are used to deliver uh, malware or, or malicious payloads to user networks for the purpose of unauthorized access and, and uh, account or cryptocurrency credential harvesting, uh, a variety of different criminal schemes that, that I've been uh, involved in. 
just to focus on one, pig butchering, for example, would it be easier or harder to tar target someone if you were wanted to facilitate pig butchering if they were already a holder of cryptocurrency? It's much easier if they are already a holder uh, by nature of that scheme if you're involved with cryptocurrency as the, the method of uh, profit. If someone doesn't have a cryptocurrency account or is unfamiliar with uh, the operations of cryptocurrency transactions, you have to instruct them on that, uh, guide them through setting up the account, uh, explain the basics of the technology to them and so forth. Whereas if that individual is already active in the space, uh, it, that barrier is removed and you can get right to the true elements of the, the crime, which are getting them to uh, deposit assets into fraudulent accounts. Got it. And are crimes involving blockchain and or cryptocurrency different than those involving traditional or fiat currency? Yes, they are different. And how so? Well, one, as the reasons I listed in one of your previous questions, the nature of the technology itself um, is, is the primary reason, but, but there's also um, an element of um, distance between the criminal actors and the targets in the, these cases. Uh, many of the criminal actors, the, the majority of criminal actors we, we encounter are, um, in this case, in these cases, organized groups, uh, highly competent, often foreign actors um, that take advantage of their targets who may not be as sophisticated in the technology um, and use that to their advantage to uh, prevent detection or identification or judicial consequence or, or um, uh, retrieval of funds. And certain objectors have argued that cryptocurrency users are in fact more sophisticated and so are less likely to fall prey to cyber crimes. Do you agree with that statement? I do not agree with that characterization. I think uh, by very nature of the data shown in the amount, both in uh, valuation and volume of cryptocurrency fraud scams and, and crimes that continue to occur, uh, it demonstrates a, a lack of sophistication on a <laughs> high, high volume of users. Um, I also think that there is a, a mantra in uh, digital asset investing, cryptocurrency investing, of not your keys, not your crypto, which is meant to say that if you don't possess your private keys singularly in some type of cold storage or, or non-online type of uh, uh, mechanism or storage device, then you don't truly have access to your crypto. And what we see most consistently is that the crimes that are occurring are people who surrender their keys to a exchange or other platform or through a lot of the schemes that I've identified. Uh, they surrender their keys by, by being fooled into doing so or by some type of investment uh, approach by them because they're focused on the return and uh, you know, promises of, of quick profit from, from their investments, which is not truly what the, the technology and the assets, uh, how they're intended to function in terms of a security protocol and a secure mechanism of possessing private keys. And in your opinion, FTX users specifically, would they be an easier or harder target for cyber criminal, criminals? My assessment is they would be an easier target. Um, this population of users was it was specifically marketed to as an easier and um, uh, less technical customer, uh, which uh, it appears attracted a very high volume of those individuals who in fact surrendered their keys, as I described earlier, uh, to the exchange and did not truly have uh, the full security control of their accounts. By nature of their focus solely on the return on the investment as opposed to the security of the investment, um, these individuals do not demonstrate a high level of um, 
technical awareness or security focus related to their assets. When you say these individuals, are you talking about all the individuals on FTX? I wouldn't be able to speak to all individuals, but as uh, the majority of the population certainly appears to have willfully surrendered their keys and their access to their accounts uh, in, in the investment uh, approach. Right. Um, switching gears for a second, in your experience, would simply having an individual's name but not their home address or email address be enough for a bad actor to identify them and perpetuate a cybercrime? Yes, sir. I think that is the uh, entry into that ability. Why is that? I don't think in today's day and age people exist solely as names. Uh, names are connected to a wealth of information that is available in uh, publicly available places uh, that is provided voluntarily or just by record-keeping mechanisms uh, of these individuals. And I also think criminal actors in the cyberspace related to digital asset crimes are very well versed in non-surface web uh, methodologies that provide a host of information about individuals. And what I mean by that is uh, you know, the surface web is 4% of what you and I see in our daily lives of Google and other publicly available search engines. The other 96% is deep web or dark web uh, marketplaces that traffic in uh, illicit, uh, illicitly obtained information about individuals that can be as a fee for service uh, used to link individual names uh, to actual people provided using information that is already available on in these dark web marketplaces. Let's say, for example, you had my name but nothing else. How would you go about correlating other personally identifiable information? Uh, so I would do it in those two broad lines of effort. In the publicly available public records that are uh, list your name, use that to corroborate and correlate to any online profile or persona that you have created. Uh, these are the more voluntary ways that, that you've done through your social media profile, everything from Facebook to LinkedIn to Instagram. Um, I would then uh, delve into the dark web options that have these fee-for-service uh, trafficking in personal information and start to build my portfolio of you uh, with those methods and, and start to identify you as an individual beyond just your name. And would that be difficult to do? Not in my opinion, sir. Why not? Because of the volume of information that is out there in publicly available records, in the information that is voluntarily provided by uh, most everyday people, as well as the volume of information that has been released on the dark web through the, the number of large volume hacks that have occurred. Um, everything from the Target to LinkedIn to Yahoo to Marriott, uh, there is a, a very high volume of personally identifiable information for purchase on the dark web that can be used to connect individuals uh, from their public online digital fingerprint. Now, to add to that hypothetical, let's say you also knew that I was a cryptocurrency user. Would that make it easier or harder to find out other personally identif identifiable information about me? Yeah, any piece of information helps to make that picture clearer, uh, especially financial information, especially uh, cryptocurrency information because it is publicly available on the blockchain and you can uh, research transactions using publicly available and free uh, tracking methods. So if I know that you're involved in cryptocurrency, I can start to research you through uh, different exchanges, different communications you've put out, different purchases, uh, understand what your spending profiles are, understand what type of tokens you uh, utilize, see what you're posting online about uh, your activities related to cryptocurrency and then start to actually search on the blockchain for specific transactions that match up with timelines, amounts, uh, transactions that you may be communicating. 
just to add to the hypothetical, let's say you knew that not only that I was a cryptocurrency user, but I was an FTX user and the coins I had held in my account as of a petition date, would that make it easier or harder? Yeah, any piece of information makes it easier. So uh, knowing what exchanges you're involved in, uh, the types of coins, the dates you're transacting, all of those add a level of specificity that will help to verify you are in fact the person that uh, I am researching in, in these other venues. Are you generally familiar with the Celsius Chapter 11 cases? Yes, sir. And based on what you know about the case, can you describe what happened to the Celsius retail customers when the individual names were disclosed? Yes, sir. Uh, those names were compiled and placed uh, into a uh, interactive, searchable uh, Excel spreadsheet that was put online through CelsiusNetworth.com. Uh, once that spreadsheet got was, was put online, uh, anyone was able to access it, identify the individuals, identify the amounts associated with them, and uh, conduct research from that spreadsheet. And did anything else occur in Celsius with respect to the personally identifiable information? I know there were multiple reported incidents of uh, phishing, uh, business email compromise, other types of criminal schemes that targeted the individuals listed uh, in, in that uh, spreadsheet or in those names that were released. And based on your experience, do you believe that similar attempts would occur here if the individual customer names were publicly disclosed? Yes, sir. And do you perceive a higher or lower risk of attacks in this case than in Celsius' case? I think there's a much higher risk related to this case because of uh, the prominence of the case, the notoriety of the case, uh, and also where the industry is at this particular time in the overall uh, market, uh, backed by, uh, you know, I think one thing that's very different about uh, the cryptocurrency environment is the crypto Twitter nature of how information is communicated in real time, instantaneously, and with a focus and intensity that doesn't exist in other markets. Putting aside the cryptocurrency bankruptcy cases, just generally between a cryptocurrency bankruptcy case and a regular Chapter 11 case, or even this case and a regular Chapter 11 case, do you perceive a higher or lower risk to cyber, to cyber schemes and attacks on personally identifiable information? Again, much higher in this case um, by nature of, of the crypto Twitter uh, universe, as I explained it. Um, there, there is not a uh, bankruptcy Twitter club or, or uh, population, if you will. There's not a uh, Best Buy Twitter handle. There, there is crypto Twitter, and, and that uh, feeds information and uh, really accelerates the way that um, uh, different uh, approaches and uh, perspectives are shared. Uh, and I think there's also a, a much higher visibility in this case than other bankruptcy proceedings. Right. And last couple of questions. In your experience, would disclosure of customer names in these bankruptcy cases subject customers to significant harm? Yes, sir. And the last question, are, according to some objectors, crypto users are just like anyone else, and to quote, sometimes scammers target them, and that is just a fact of life. Do you agree that subjecting yourself to constant scams and potential harm is just something that everyone needs to live with? N not at all, sir, and I think that, um, that type of, uh, casual and dismissive approach to this being just something that happens is, is not reflective of the true harm it causes. Um, and particularly in this case, for the reasons outlined, uh, cryptocurrency itself, the, the high profile nature of FTX, uh, the, the crypto Twitter uh, highlighting and, and exacerbation of the events here, as well as the, the way the industry does not have similar protections, backstops, centralized regulatory structures, uh, or a uh, you know, pr level of protection that, that traditional finance or, or other schemes may have uh, makes this a much more significant risk and harm to those involved. Thank you, Mr. Chardon. Your Honor, no further questions at this time. Thank you. Anyone else wish to ask questions in support? Yes, yes. Your Honor. 
Good morning, Your Honor. For the record, David Wender with Evershed Sutherland on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee of Non-U.S. Customers. Good morning, Mr. Sheridan. Good morning, sir. Um, just a, hopefully just a few questions. The good portion of your declaration and testimony today focused on the potential harm to individuals. That same harm is also subjected to on corporations and business entities, correct? Possibly, sir. Yes, sir. And in fact, in your declaration, you talk about that you have experience on ways that businesses are also impacted by this. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Great. And in fact, Exhibit P to your declaration, and if you need to look at it, although I'm just going to, it's really paragraph 23, talks about the biggest data breaches of the 21st century. Those were all companies, right? That's correct. And Exhibit Q, where it talks about the biggest crypto heist, those are also companies, not individuals, right? Uh, the crypto heist one, I don't have off memory, can refer it's to. It's Exhibit Q, and, I, and, it, and it's not. I'm just looking at it quickly, and I can even highlight it as well. Is it 17 biggest crypto heists of all time? And it's Exhibit Q to your declaration, and it lists Mt. Gox, or Geox, I never pronounced that correctly. That's, a, that's an entity, right? And if I went through all them, I don't see an individual's name there. Tab 18. Huh? Tab 18, sorry. Okay. I apologize, I had a tab by, by letters. The, the only distinction I would make, sir, is that I think uh, while the data breaches are companies, the crypto heists are of wallets within those companies that are associated with individuals. Um, and that may be just parsing words, but, yeah, but they, they were held in centralized locations of exchanges. So, Yeah, but those affected entities, but then also in turn potentially their customers, their individuals and other entities, subparts, right? Yes, sir. Because when, when hackers attack a business entity, they, they go after the business information at times, correct? Yes, sir. And then also, for example, customer lists of their own people, employees, and the like. So individual information is also at times attacked by hackers when they go after corporate entities. Yes, sir. Fair? Great. And then and you talked about here where it's the involvement of individuals and their names were such that people could identify them and be able to target them more specifically. Now, if a customer had to list both their name their address and their holdings, that would make it an easier target, right? Significantly, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Now, and so, and you talked about business email compromise earlier as part of your declaration. So in, in a business email compromise, are they more effective if someone first obtains access to a corporate network? Does that question make sense? It makes sense, I would say, I wouldn't classify the business email compromise as more effective. I would classify account spoofing as more effective. It's it's a different scheme, but um, if the point of your question is the, the business nature, um, if you obtain access to, as I've seen in, in cases I've investigated, uh, the domain name server of the business, you can then spoof uh, that domain and redirect potential users of that domain to fraudulent First, correct for, thank you for correcting my question and making it more expert. I'm not an expert, but thank you for that. But then it is easier, and in that situation, to once you spoof, to use your term hopefully correctly, then you can get access to individual information and their assets in furtherance of their, their hacking or, or schemes. Is that correct? That happens at times? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Nothing further. Anyone else in support? Okay, Fox. <laughs> Your Honor, this is water, not coffee. I just, That's fine. I don't <laughs> want you to be worried I'm like spilling things. Coffee, coffee and water both spill. But that's okay. oh, <laughs> all right. It does less harm, I suppose. Um, okay, uh, for the record, again, Julie Sarkeesian on behalf of the U.S. Trustee. Your Honor, before I um, commence my cross, I, I think, and, and maybe I missed this, but it, it's my understanding that Mr. Sheridan is being offered as an expert witness. I'm just not sure that that was distinct, expressly stated, and I just want the record to be 
clear on that if that is the case. Your Honor, it doesn't need to be stated, but yes, he is. Okay. Well, normal procedure would be if you got an expert, you qualify them. I say that they're an expert witness, and then you get to elicit the testimony from them. You didn't follow it. That's fine. I don't have any issue. I think his qualifications are absolutely clear that he's an expert in this field, so I have no problem with recognizing him as an expert in the field. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. I'm not objecting to him being an expert. I just wanted the record to be clear that that was how he was being offered. Thank you. Okay, sir, I have – let me start. I have a few – first of all, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. I have a few questions. I'm going to start with your declaration. And really, this is for – I'm asking questions so I can better understand, have better clarity. On the first thing, and I'm not sure how significant this is, but you talk about in paragraph 4, you say at the last sentence, as I possess a top secret slash sensitive compartmented information security clearance. And my question is, is that – you're no longer working for the government, correct? I'm sorry, ma'am? You're no longer an employee of the government. Is that correct? That's correct. So do you still have the top secret slash sensitive compartmented security clearance? Yes, ma'am. And how long will that last for? Another three and a half years. You go through five-year periodic updates. Which I am familiar with because I'm a government employee. Yes, ma'am. Mine was shortly before I retired, and so just based on the timeline. Thank you. Okay. With respect to – if you could maybe turn to paragraph 10 of your declaration, please. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the first sentence says, the odds of success for identity and asset theft crimes are increased even further if they are committed against vulnerable persons, such as the debtor's customers in these Chapter 11 cases. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. So my question is, how about individuals who are not customers of the debtors but are other types of creditors in these cases? Would knowing that such an individual was a creditor of FTX, not a customer but some other kind of creditor, would that make it more likely that they could be a victim of identity theft than any other person? If I knew someone was a creditor in some other proceeding, I would need to know the full circumstances. The line of thought behind that statement in paragraph 10 is based on my knowledge of FTX, the amounts involved, the steep and contradictory way in which that exchange went from the most prominently secure and qualified custodian to one that was accused of committing acts of fraud with customer funds. I think when an individual invests in something that they are very confident in that turns out to be the exact opposite of that set of circumstances and there is high valuation involved, that creates an opportunity and a vulnerability that could be exploited. So I would need to know the full circumstances of the other situation you're asking me about. Because what you just testified to would apply just to actual customers of FTX, correct? The way I have it described, yes. Would you please turn to paragraph 15 of your declaration, please, which deals with the term pig butchering? Yes, ma'am. So this question may relate to some other 
provisions in your declaration as well, but do, do you have an understanding? I assume you know what a cold wallet is, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, could you explain what that is? It is a wallet that is not connected to online functionality. So as I referenced earlier, you can store your wallet information, your private key, public key, seed phrase, and um, wallet addresses in a uh, medium, usually a USB type device that is not connected to online internet. Do you have an understanding of whether in these cases, the, the debtor's current management um, has transferred all customer accounts into cold wallets. I may not be saying it exactly correctly, but do you, do you have an understanding about that? I do not know what storage methods are being used by FTX. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. I do not know how they are storing customer funds. If customer funds are being, in any situation, are being stored in a cold wallet, does that make it more difficult for a bad actor to access that account, even if they have the person's name? To access the funds in the wallet? Yeah, their funds cold. in the account. Yes, ma'am. Cold wallet storage is a much more secure way to store uh, digital assets. So if a bad actor, even if they knew a name of a customer, they would not be able to break into a cold wallet to steal money out of the customer account. Is that correct? I wouldn't characterize it that way because many of the cryptocurrency frauds involve manipulation of individuals. And uh, once you know that individual and can engage with them, you can manipulate them into accessing their cold wallet, putting it in a warm or hot state online, and then harvest their credentials, uh, conduct you know, these types of schemes by having them bring their cold wallet into a hot or warm state. Are you talk when you're talking about in the individuals that the, the, the wrongdoer is contacting, do you mean somebody who's an actual customer? That they're getting that customer, they're manipulating the customer to get access to the cold wallet? Yes, in a, gen in a general sense. If, if the customer doesn't have access and can't get their cold wallet. Um, that manipulation would not work, correct? Yes, if, you, if the customer can't get their funds, you can't manipulate them into uh, using their funds or submitting their funds for criminal purposes. That's correct. Now you had, I'm jumping now for a minute to your live testimony today. You testified, I think you testified that FTX customers prior to the bankruptcy had turned over keys to their account to wrongdoers. Did, did I understand that correctly? No, ma'am. Okay. All right, so you don't have any knowledge as to prior to the bankruptcy whether any FTX customers were the victim of um, some, uh, you know, wrongdoing where they were manipulated into turning over their keys or any other way to access their accounts? I do not have information about specific FTX customers. And if you could please turn to paragraph 20 of your declaration, please, which concerns SIM swapping. Yes, ma'am. And then um, if you go down to, well, I, I won't focus you on any particular sentence, but this the S SIM swapping has to do with 
cell phones, correct? Yes, ma'am. SIM swapping is referred to. Yes, ma'am. Does this method work if the individual, the individual has an account, again, does not have access to it because it's in a cold wallet? So I think the distinction I would make is that the specific funds in that cold wallet, the answer would be the same as your previous question. They would not be, if the target does not have access to those funds because they're in a cold wallet that the target cannot obtain. However, you know, there are other criminal schemes that could be executed beyond those specific funds if that individual had assets in other wallets, other hot wallets, or other locations. On paragraph 22, if you could please turn to paragraph 22 of your declaration. Yes, ma'am. So the first sentence says, beyond the potential for physical harm, emotional distress, cyber threats, kidnapping, stalking, and bullying that could occur, malfactors could likely determine the physical address of the debtor's customer as a result of disclosure of individual customer names. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. So my question is, with respect to the physical address, is it any easier to find a person's physical address knowing that they happen to be a customer of FTX as opposed to getting the physical address of any other person? I think that whatever the source of information is, whether it's a customer of FTX or others, the description related to this is the harm that would come because they're a customer of FTX. And this, for ease of communicating the idea, this crypto Twitter idea about very public, vocal, elevated, and heightened type of instant communication surrounding cryptocurrency holders, cryptocurrency events, especially events of this nature and magnitude. Okay, so just to be clear, the fact that somebody was a customer of FTX coupled with just their name does not make it easier for a wrongdoer to find their physical address as opposed to any other individual who's not a customer of FTX. I think if you have the fact that they're a customer of FTX, that's a piece of information. If I simply have your name and no other information versus having your name and you're a customer of FTX coupled with the amount of your account transaction volume with the type of token that you're engaging with in FTX or utilizing as a customer, those pieces of, every piece of information is an asset in my investigation to identify them. So customer of FTX, yes, that's a piece of information that I now can use to research chat forums, transactions on the blockchain, other types of investigative material related specifically to cryptocurrency that may be of value to help me identify them as opposed to just name and no cryptocurrency engagement whatsoever. Right, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think you're actually, I don't know that you've actually answered my question. My question is very simple. Okay. For somebody who's a wrongdoer, is it easier to find an individual's physical address knowing that they're an FTX customer than some other individual who's not an FTX customer? Yes, ma'am. It is easier to find their physical address just knowing that they're an FTX customer? Yes, ma'am. Explain to me how that is. Not other information, but just their address, their physical address. And I'll try and explain it a different way. I apologize if I, in my previous answer, I didn't. Knowing you're an FTX, so I would not stop there with the name Jeremy Sheridan, an FTX customer. 
if, if my investigation stopped there, I would submit that I, your question is, is yes, I would, that wouldn't help me at all. But knowing that you're an FTX customer, I know you're going to be involved in cryptocurrency. I know you're going to have uh, involvement in other transactions related to cryptocurrency. You may be involved in cryptocurrency chat forums. You may be involved in other exchanges. You may be involved in crypto Twitter. I will use that as an investigative lead to start to build that profile of you because I know you're a customer of FTX and you have been engaged in cryptocurrency transactions. As opposed to just the name Jeremy Sheridan, it, it gives me a piece of investigative information that I will build upon. That's the way criminals or as an investigator, I identify you, is by taking those pieces of information and corroborating them to other pieces of information to build you as a person. But isn't the, one of the benefits of cryptocurrency is supposed to be that it's anonymous and that you're not revealing your address or even many times your email address in doing these crypto transactions. Isn't that correct? I think uh, anonymity in cryptocurrency is a misconception. Okay. Uh, it is pseudo -anon anonymous, uh, but it is also publicly available uh, access to digital cryptographic transactions that occur in public open space that anyone can access at any time. So it is in many ways contrary to anonymity. I understand. Um, now I want to go to your um, the live testimony this morning in response to um, counsel for the ad hoc committee. And he asked you some questions about harm to corporations who are customers. But he also asked you, if I understand correctly, he was, he was tying together a situation in which a corporation is the FTX customer, not the employees of the corporation, but the corporation is an FTX customer. And that that can result in some harm to the employees of that company, even if they are not themselves FTX customers. Is that, is that correct? I answered those questions based on customers of that company, not employees of that company. Is that, is uh, that your question? Customers of, customers of a company that's customers of FTX? If a company is a customer of FTX, then who, who is it that's going to be harmed other than the customer of FTX? The downstream customers of that company. Okay. And how is that? A company does not exist in a vacuum, in my opinion. It is comprised of customers who uh, engage in the business operations of that company. So if a company is involved in FTX and um, through invest, I would have to know the circumstances of their business operations, dealings, and connections. But if I could identify individuals who were customers of that company, um, I could then, in similar ways to the individual customer names, start to build a profile of those customers and uh, execute similar criminal schemes of the customers of that parent company. So let's say you have two companies. One's company A, they're a customer of FTX. You have company B who's not a customer of FTX. Both A and B have their own customers. Yes. Knowing that company A is a customer of FTX, does that make it any easier to figure out who company A's customers are as opposed to company B's customers? My answer would be similar to your previous question about individuals. It's another piece of investigative information that uh, possesses publicly available blockchain information about financial transactions that I could potentially use to identify individuals who are engaging in those business activities. If a com when a company is, a co is engaging in transactions on the F not not currently, but pre prior to bankruptcy, was engaging in transactions on the FTX format with cryptocurrency, how is that providing any information about their customers? I would have to know the circumstances of it. In, in, in a vacuum, if it's just the company name, 
um, it would take additional investigative steps. But similar ways as I've described before, if it's a company that is investing in crypto assets that are being placed on FTX, and then I can investigate that company uh, and identify through open source information or dark web information, vulnerabilities in the company, um, individuals posting about the company, individuals communicating about their crypto transactions with the company, there are possibilities and, and ways to identify individuals who are engaged in those activities. It's, a, it's another layer of, of um, uh, distance from an individual um, and speaking without true specifics about all of the details. Uh, it's hard to be uh, more concrete, but it is possible to build that type of identification. It, isn't it also true it's possible to go, again, take a company that's not an FTX customer and go to their website, find out things about them, do all of the things you're talking about on the dark web and find out information about their customers as well, right? Uh, objection, Your Honor. Please answer this question two or three times now. No rule. You can answer it. That is possible, yes. Thank you. Okay. I believe those are all of my questions of this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Sheridan. My name is Katie Townsend. I'm one of the attorneys representing um, the news media interveners, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and Bloomberg in this matter. Good morning, ma'am. Um, I'm going to do uh, something similar to what Ms. Sarkeesian did, which is and start with your declaration and then move to some questions from your live testimony today. Um, you testified that you're the managing director, at, uh, a managing director, excuse me, at FTI Consulting. Is that the financial advisor for the official committee of unsecured creditors in this matter? FTI Consulting as a whole? Yes. Yes. Um, to simplify things, by the way, if I use the phrase official committee, mm -hmm. you'll know I'm talking about the official committee of unsecured creditors, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And if I use the word or the term individuals, you'll know I'm referring to natural persons and not entities, right? Yes, ma'am. Do you know the uh, identities of any individuals who are members of the official committee? No, ma'am. Do you know the identities of any individuals who are among debtors' top 50 creditors? No, ma'am. Do you know the identities of any individuals who are uh, customers of the debtors whose names have been redacted from the filings in this case? No, ma'am. You testified that um, by combining the name, oh, well, let me do it this way. Do you have a paragraph nine of your declaration in front of you? Yes, ma'am. Um, you testified in this, in this paragraph, you state that um, by combining the name of an individual with other publicly available sources, a malefactor will be able to harvest a full biography of a person, what you refer to as a dossier. Um, that's true of anyone, isn't it? Not just the creditor customers of debtors in this case. Is it true that a criminal actor can, ident can create a dossier of any individual they're trying to target? Yes. Um, I wouldn't say it's true of anyone. Uh, I think you need corroborating information, um, which in today's day and age is, is generally easy to find. I mean, is there someone who's completely removed themselves from the ability to do that? It's possible. Uh, is that because how much, how much information is available about a person from publicly available sources varies by person? Yes, some people are easier to build that than others, yes. Um, you don't know what, if any, steps any of the customers of the debtors whose names 
have been redacted from the filings in this case have taken to limit what information is available about them from publicly available sources, do you? I do not. Would you say that a data breach involving an individual's data could increase the likelihood that someone will be targeted by an online scam regardless of whether that individual holds cryptocurrency? That's accurate. And information obtained through data breaches involving, I think you gave the examples of Yahoo, LinkedIn, Facebook, Marriott, uh, they're not going to include the data of anyone who didn't use those services, correct? I don't know that for sure what type of data was released uh, in each of those instances. In other words, if the Facebook data breach involved uh, an individual user plus their contact list, then that would be individuals who are greater than the specific individual whose data was breached. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So um, if I understand it correctly, to the ex it, it depends on the nature of the information that was involved in the breach. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, but, well, let me say it this way. Um, hypothetically, if it did not involve a data breach of, let's say, Facebook, did not involve the contact information, an individual's contact information, an individual Facebook user's contact information. Um, would that data breach have captured information of, of individuals who are not users of Facebook? Again, it, it depends on the nature of the breach. If the breach involves, um, you know, into uh, administrator accounts on that individual's profile, then anything that individual has accessed to include other individuals, you know, if this individual that was targeted serves in a data processing capacity or somehow stores information of other individuals or financial information of other individuals within their network or on their system, and that data breach compromised that. In other words, it's not just a data breach about your name or your uh, personally identifiable information, but it's a data breach of your system and your administrator access to your entire files, then the data breach could be much larger. You don't know what steps, if any, any of the customers of debtors whose names have been redacted in this case have taken to protect information that may have been compromised in a data breach, do you? I do not know that information. There are ways for individuals who learn that their information may have been compromised in a data breach to seek to protect that information, aren't there? Yes, the number one rule in uh, protecting yourself online is not to put your name or other identifiable information out there, so yes. Um, can you take a look at paragraph 10 of your declaration? Yes, ma'am. Um, you testify that uh, the odds of success for identity and asset theft crimes are increased if they are committed against vulnerable persons, such as the debtors' customers in these Chapter 11 cases, whose circumstances provide greater opportunity to or reduced defense against the malefactor. Can you tell me what the basis is for your assertion that any of the debtor's customers are vulnerable persons? Similar to my answer before, uh, it is a assessment based on the very quick change that FTX's prominence uh, and purported uh, offerings to customers demonstrated in this case. In other words, FTX was seen as the pillar and strength and shining star of the cryptocurrency uh, industry, and I think it generated a lot of trust, safety, and security in its customer base that 
was quickly changed based on the nature of this of everything that occurred and so I think when someone encounters that type of um, violation for lack of a better word they are in what I would consider a vulnerable state especially in financial circumstances so is it fair to say that it is the fact that they're involved in this bankruptcy proceeding that in your view makes however many of the debtors approximately nine million customers who are individuals more vulnerable to potential scams um, can you repeat the question sure. I'm sorry. Um, trying to do this as best I can um, in your view is it just the fact that these individuals are involved in this bankruptcy proceeding that makes them, in your view, more vulnerable? I think the totality of circumstances and uh, considerations in this case make them more vulnerable. This is one element of it. Can you explain that a little bit? I'm, I'm, when you say the totality of the circumstances, you're referring to the fact that they're FTX customers only, or is there something more? I'm just trying to get to the your the basis for your understanding as to why these customers are more vulnerable. Yes, it is. If I understand your question correctly, why do I consider these customers more vulnerable? Is that right? right. Um, again, because they were in uh, a business and financial situation that was considered to be very secure, very safe, uh, something that would result in a uh, profitable and uh, income earning opportunity that very quickly, very publicly, very steeply, uh, those circumstances changed to be the exact inverse of that. And when you, in my opinion, deal with that type of uh, cognitive dissonance between what you expect and what reality uh, presents, it creates a situation in which you may be more willing to um, seek ways to correct that. And that is an opportunity for criminal actors to take advantage of that perspective, that position, or that mental state, and may make those individuals more vulnerable to the types of cyber crimes I've described. In your view, does do um, all, start that, in your view, are all of the something close to nine million customers of FTX equally vulnerable because of their involvement with FTX? I think they're all equally vulnerable, not necessarily because of this mental state if you're focused on paragraph 10 I think they're all equally vulnerable because of the increased risks in this situation uh, the circumstances I've described the nature of cryptocurrency the public profile of this case the, uh, the inflammatory nature of crypto Twitter the lack of institutional and traditional financial backstops and provisions and protections uh, that, that are in place I think they're equally vulnerable for all of the circumstances not just What's described in paragraph 10? Well, is paragraph 10 intended to be referring to the customer's mental state? Because the last sentence of that says some of the debtor's individual customers may be vulnerable due to the monetary losses they have experienced. Vulnerability in this specific paragraph, paragraph 10, mm -hmm is a perspective and I wouldn't disagree with the characterization of mental state, but uh, what I mean in that last sentence is that mental state and that uh, perspective of victimization and intent to correct that victimization or recoup from those losses if your losses are higher or the valuations you have um, placed at FTX that are now uh, not available to you 
I would I am presenting that that creates a potentially higher level of vulnerability because of evaluations involved. You testified earlier that you don't know the identities of any of the debtors' customers whose names have been redacted from the filings in this case. So is it fair to say that you don't know the financial circumstances of any of those individuals? That is correct. In preparing your testimony today, did you, or your declaration, uh, did you attempt to determine whether or not being involved in a bankruptcy proceeding outside of the cryptocurrency context makes an individual more vulnerable to attempted identity and asset theft crimes? I think those circumstances, in my opinion, are different than this situation because of the cryptocurrency element. So I did not. You did not. Um, is it fair to say that, in your opinion, the most relevant types of online financial fraud scams here are business email compromise, romance scams, pig butchering, phishing attacks, and account spoofing? Uh, I don't think you listed SIM swaps, uh, which I would add to that list. Okay. Um, that's certainly not an all-inclusive list. Mm -hmm. I think those are the ones with which I have the most ex personal experience of conducting investigations uh, related to cryptocurrency schemes, which is why I listed them. Okay. Um, can you look at paragraph 13 of your declaration? This refers to business email compromise scams? Yes, ma'am. Is that sometimes also referred to as an email account compromise? I would not refer to it as that. Okay. You've never heard that? I've heard of email account compromise, but I don't equate it to business email compromise. What's the difference? Uh, an email account compromise could just be unauthorized access to your individual email for a variety of reasons, n maybe not necessarily financially motivated. It could be uh, just to find information about you, a you know, stalking case or, or some other way to obtain information on you. Business email compromise is specifically intended to uh, misrepresent a business transaction or operation in email format and target an individual for the purpose of illicit financial gain. I see. Okay. Um, can a business email compromise scheme target anyone with an email address? Can it target anyone with an email address? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, business email compromise scams are not unique to the cryptocurrency context, correct? That is correct. In preparing your declaration or your testimony today, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are targeted with business email compromise scams versus how often individuals who are not known cryptocurrency holders are targeted with that kind of scam? I did not make that distinction, no. Um, and Similar question, but slightly different. In preparing your declaration or your testimony in this matter, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are victims of business email compromise scam versus non-cryptocurrency holders? Again, I didn't make comparison between cryptocurrency holder and non-cryptocurrency holder. My assessments are based on the cryptocurrency holder information being more substantive and fruitful for identifying individuals for criminal schemes. So you're not aware of any data that shows that cryptocurrency holders are, are more likely to be victims of business email compromise scams than non-cryptocurrency holders, are you? I believe the chain analysis report uh, does make crypto-specific statistical uh, determinations, but I don't have those memorized or, or uh, <laughs> part, of, memorized? Um, <laughs> part of my uh, information yet. And why, why don't I show you um, what I think is what you're referring to? Um, 
2023 crypto crime report dated February 23rd was attached as Exhibit E to your declaration? Yes, that's what I'm referring to. Do you have a copy of that, or do you need a copy of it? Uh, do yes, ma'am. You do have a copy? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, your Honor, do you need a copy of I have this? it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you indicated that this report, well, let me ask you this first. What's chain analysis? Uh, it's chain analysis. Chain, they, excuse they, me, chain analysis. What is they, chain analysis? Uh, they are a investigative um, company that provides data on all types of crypto operations, everything from transactions to criminal activity uh, and in between. They also third-party supplier of a blockchain analytics tool called Reactor that I referred to in uh, my credentials. And Reactor is a um, uh, searchable engine that allows you to identify cryptocurrency transactions and use that for attribution of individual users. Did you have any involvement in preparation of, in the preparation of this, uh, of this report? No, ma'am. Is this report one of the documents that you relied on to prepare your testimony in this matter? I read this report as part of my job for all functions that I do uh, related to crypto investigations, not specifically for my testimony. Okay. Um, you indicated that this report has data that shows how often cryptocurrency holders or known cryptocurrency holders are targeted uh, with business email compromise schemes versus non-cryptocurrency holders. I, I, know, I realize it's a big report, but can you point this to me? I want to make yeah. a clarification on that. Oh, of course. This report documents and reports on cryptocurrency crimes of which business email compromises are one of them, if I believe, if I remember the category. From there, it would be possible to make the distinction you're asking me about, about business email compromise crimes that involve cryptocurrency, which I would get from this report to DOJ's, FBI's Bureau of Statistics about business email compromise in general. I wasn't saying that I could go to this I report see. and make that distinction. I could use this report for data in order to then make that distinction. Okay, I, I misunderstood. Um, so sitting here today, you can't, Speak to the difference between how mo how more how much more frequently a known cryptocurrency holder is a victim of business email compromise scam than a non known cryptocurrency holder scam. I, I could not give you that okay. data. Okay. Um, can you turn to Exhibit D uh, of the declaration that you proffered? Let me know if you, I think you have a copy of everything, or you don't yeah, have a I copy Yeah, I just need to know the tab, please. It's, oh. it's tab five. Tab five. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you tell me what this is? This is a business email compromise uh, report uh, as published by, I think this was an FBI um, advisory. And you, uh, is this one of the documents that you relied on um, in preparing your declaration? Yes. If you look at paragraph 13 of your declaration, um, there's a site to this, and I, I believe a quote uh, from this document in the last sentence of paragraph 13. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Um, your declaration 
the last sentence reads, knowledge of the target's personal details is integral to the execution of this scheme, referring to the business email compromise scheme, such that the Federal Bureau of Investigation's first recommended safeguard against them is to be careful with what information you share online, dot, dot, dot. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, if you look at the document um, that, that you cited to Exhibit D. Yes, ma'am. The last part of um, that FBI proviso is, says um, it's the first, I think, bullet point under how to protect yourself. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. And it indicates by openly sharing, let's state, be careful with what information you share online or on social media by openly sharing things like pet names, schools you attended, links to family members, and your birthday, you can give a scammer all the information they need to guess your password or answer your security, uh, or answer your security question, excuse me. Um, are, when you stated in your declaration that knowledge of the target's personal details is integral to the execution of a business email compromise scheme, are those the kind of personal details, pet names, schools attended, birthdays that you were referring to? Those could certainly be helpful in a business email compromise. Business email compromise details, however, are more related to business activities of the individual, uh, whether they're involved in purchasing a home or um, you know, buying a business or selling a business or conducting any type of uh, online business operations. So different information than what's in the, the FBI proviso in your view or more, more financial information. Yeah, I mean, any information when you're conducting a criminal scheme is of value. So in my experience, have I seen business email compromise that reference what the FBI is listing here about personal, what I would consider personal versus business details? Uh, I have not seen that. However, the personal details that are listed here would be used to create what I call the dossier of the individual. And from that, I could learn their business operations, learn what they're engaged in, and then specifically tailor the business email compromise to more effectively target them. So it is related. It's just not something that would directly be in the business email compromise, or business email of the business email compromise scheme. Would you say that not or being careful about sharing that kind of information online is a online safety tip that's generally applicable to everyone? Yes. Uh, let's uh, talk about phishing. Is it fair to say that phishing is a way to carry out a business email compromise or email account compromise scam? Yes, the distinctions in titles and definitions sometimes are overlapping. And phishing involves a bad actor posing as a known or trusted entity through an email, text message, or instant message, right? That's correct. Uh, a phishing scheme can target anyone who uses email, text messages, or instant messages, correct? Yes, it can. It's not unique to the cryptocurrency context, is it? It is not unique to cryptocurrency, no. And in your professional experience, have You've seen successful phishing attacks in the cryptocurrency context and outside the cryptocurrency context, haven't you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in preparing your declaration and your testimony in this matter today, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are phishing targets versus how often non-known cryptocurrency holders are phishing targets? No, ma'am. And Similar question. In preparing your testimony in this matter or your declaration, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are victims of phishing attacks versus how often individuals who are not known cryptocurrency holders are victims of phishing attacks? I did not review data. I relied on my personal experience. And in your personal experience, are known cryptocurrency holders more often victims of phishing attacks than non-known cryptocurrency holders? 
yes, ma'am, it's a more effective way to generate criminal proceeds because of the circumstances of and nature of the asset, as I described earlier. It's instantaneous, near instantaneous, it's global, it's valuable, it's pseudo-anonymous, it's irreversible. And so it is both the method and the means in which the majority of criminal schemes in an online sense are, are conducted in, our, in the bulk of our investigations. So just so I, I understand your answer, to your testimony that in your experience, you're more likely to be a victim of a phishing attack if you are a known holder of cryptocurrency than if you are not a known holder of cryptocurrency? Again, we don't make those distinctions. What I'm saying is it's more, the, the schemes are carried out using cryptocurrency in an overwhelming number of cases because that's how the criminals are paid and that's how the proceeds are transferred. Whether or not the criminal knows the individual is a known holder or not, we don't make that distinction similar to the answers I've provided before. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, can you look at exhibit C to your declaration um, and let me know if you need a copy or if anyone else needs a copy. <clears throat> Um, it's a news article from yeah. oh, tab four. Tab four, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, ma'am. This is a news article from December 2022 entitled Crypto, Crypto Users Claim Gemini Email Leak Occurred Much Earlier Than First Reported. Is this a um, article that you relied on in preparing your declaration today? Or your testimony today? Excuse me. I don't recall relying on this heavily. I think this was included just as a uh, means of example and reference. Okay. The article reported that after the cryptocurrency exchange, Gemini suffered a data breach. Users of that exchange reported receiving phishing emails. Is that right? That's Is that correct. your understanding? That's correct. Okay. And that data breach included the customer's email addresses and partial phone numbers, not just their names. Is that correct? Or is that your understanding? Uh, yes, that's correct. Do you have any information about those phishing attempts uh, related to that Gemini leak other than the, other than what is in Exhibit C? No, ma'am. Okay. You don't know, for example, when, whether any of those phishing attempts were successful? Correct. Um, can we look at uh, paragraph 17 of your declaration? And this pertains to uh, account spoofing? Yes, ma'am. Is account spoofing another way to carry out a business email compromise or email account compromise scam? Again, the distinctions blur because there is email involved in an account spoofing scheme. So by technical definition, you could call it a business email compromise. But the precipitating criminal action of the account spoof is not generally conducted through business email compromise, although it can be. Um, so is it fair to say that account spoofing entails a bad actor disguising an email address, display name, phone number, text message, or website URL to convince the target that the source of a message is legitimate? That's accurate. Account spoofing can target anyone who uses a computer or a cell phone, right? Yes, ma'am. And it's not unique to the cryptocurrency context, is it? No. In preparing your testimony, did you review any data or research that compared how often known cryptocurrency holders are targets of account spoofing scams versus non-known cryptocurrency holders? Uh, similar answers to before, I did not make those distinctions. Okay, and I'm sorry for the repetition. No, just <laughs> And in preparing your testimony, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are victims of account spoofing as opposed to non-cryptocurrency holders? No, again, in, in 
my experience, the, the majority of victims and targets that we dealt with were cryptocurrency holders by nature of how these crimes are executed. I understand. Similar answer to, to the previous types of scams. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you look at paragraph 18 to your declaration? Yes, ma'am. Um, this relates to NRAID Celsius uh, Network LLC. Does FTI Consulting have any involvement in the Celsius bankruptcy? Not in my practice. I don't know about FTI as a whole. Okay. So let me ask you this then. Do you personally have any involvement in the Celsius bankruptcy? No, ma'am. Your declaration states that many Celsius customers became the target of phishing attacks by scammers posing as bankruptcy lawyers using emails and phone calls. What's the basis for, for that statement? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. In paragraph 18 of your declaration, you state that many Celsius customers became the target of phishing attacks by scammers posing as bankruptcy lawyers using emails and phone calls. What is the basis for that statement in your declaration? Uh, the, the referenced attachments to the declaration, both uh, media reports as well as the um, legal documents that, that were produced following these uh, phishing and, and other criminal attempts. Is that statement based on any anything else? The statement based on anything else? Or I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just asking if, if your knowledge of what's in paragraph 18 is based solely on those um, exhibits that you cited in your declaration. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Do you know how many Celsius customers were the target of those phishing attempts? I don't know specifically. Do you know how many of the Celsius customers who were the target of those phishing attempts were foreign individuals? I don't know, ma'am. And do you know how many of those phishing attempts targeting Celsius customers were successful? No, ma'am. The exhibits that uh, attached your declaration, I'll strike that. Do you know how uh, debtors' attorneys in the Celsius case became aware of these phishing attempts? No. The notices that are attached to your declaration that have been entered into evidence indicate that there were steps taken both by the court and by the parties in the Celsius bankruptcy to notify anyone involved of, of those phishing attempts. Is that is that your understanding? That is my understanding. Do you think that's a prudent step to take? I do, but even as referenced in those attempts, there is uh, acknowledgement and, admi and admission that they will not reach all customers. So uh, I think that's a limited approach at best. But it is an approach that you would recommend, that you would agree the court should have taken in that, in that case or that the debtor's counsel should have taken in that case? Yes, ma'am. And why is that? You have to try and address the problem. And one way to address the problem is to put people on notice that it's possible that they may be the target of phishing attempts? That is one way to address the problem, yes. Can you look at paragraph 14 of your declaration? And I apologize for jumping around a little bit. Um, romance scams are another common type of online financial fraud, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's when a bad actor pretends to build a romantic relationship with a victim online in order to convince them or guilt them into sending money, right? Yes, ma'am. Romance scams can target anyone, correct? Yes, ma'am. And they're not unique to the cryptocurrency context, are they? No, ma'am. In preparing your testimony in this case, did you review any data or research comparing how often known cryptocurrency holders are targets of romance scams versus how often individuals who are not known cryptocurrency holders are targets of romance scams? Similar answers to before, ma'am, no. And in preparing your testimony, did you review any data or research comparing how often 
known cryptocurrency holders are victims of romance scams versus how often those individuals who are not known cryptocurrency holders are victims of romance scams. Similar to before, no, it's just personal experience that the majority of these scams involve cryptocurrency. Um, can you look at page or paragraph, excuse me, 15, the next paragraph, pig butchering, is another type or common type of online financial fraud in your view? Yes, right. ma'am. And these are, is it fair to say that a pig butchering scam is one that targets a bad actor who forms an online relationship with their target, convinces them to invest in cryptocurrency, and then steals the invested funds? Yes, ma'am. Is it, though it involves the use of cryptocurrency to perpetrate the fraud, pig butchering targets individuals who are not known cryptocurrency holders via text message and social media, right? I don't have personal experience with that. Every pig butchering case that I have seen involves cryptocurrency holders by nature of the scheme itself to continue to invest not only in the opportunity because it takes advantage of cryptocurrency holders, it explains different facets of the industry and leverages this idea of quick returns, high volume returns, and is facilitated by all of the characteristics of cryptocurrency that I've listed several times uh, in order to be able to be successful. So in every example of pig butchering that you have personal experience with, the victim, prior to being contacted by the bad actor, already had an existing wallet cryptocurrency assets. Is that accurate? The ones that I've investigated. It is, to, if I understand your question, it is possible for that person not to have cryptocurrency and for the bad actor to convince them to set up a cryptocurrency wallet to further facilitate the crime. But it, that again, by nature involves cryptocurrency. In those cases that, that you don't have dealt with in your personal experience, did the target know that the individual Strike that, I said it backwards. Um, in those cases that you have dealt with in your personal experience involving pig butchering, did the bad actor know in advance that the target already had cryptocurrency assets? I can't testify to that because that w is not a focus of our information gathering or interview of suspects. We, that's not something we focus on related to the investigation. So you don't, you don't know because that isn't something that you would have asked during the investigation? That's correct. Is that right? That's okay, correct. so just to make sure I have this right, you don't know if any of those individuals in those pig butchering scams that you dealt with personally were targeted because they were known cryptocurrency holders? We made that conclusion based on who they targeted, but I did not ask the criminal actor specifically that question. I see. How many such cases have you, did you, have you dealt with in your career? Um, personally or in a leadership position? Personally. So the group of pig butchering cases that we're talking about? Uh, there have been uh, three cases that I would classify as specific pig butchering. What's the most common form of cryptocurrency scam? Theft of crypto assets. Is, are investment scams the most common form of cryptocurrency scam? I mean, that's a very broad definition. Um, Again, I don't make distinctions on 
most common scam. Um, can you be more specific on what you mean by an investment scam? Maybe I can answer the question there. Sure. Why don't you take a look at, at Exhibit E, if, if you have that handy again. That's the 2023 uh, crypto crime report that was um, attached to your declaration. Yeah. Tab six. Thank you. Wait, you don't have to do it anymore. Um, can you look at page 91? Uh, yes. Of that? Yeah. I believe I have the right page. Oh, I apologize. 92. I have the wrong page. It's at the 92 at the bottom. Yes, ma'am. Does this... I want to make sure I'm not pointing in the wrong direction. Are you referring to 92 of the report or the page number I, at the top? That is the, the issue, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, yes. I um, Can you take a look at Page, it's 47 at the bottom, 91 at the top, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Apologize. I think I just have the wrong page for you, and I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. One second. I do recall call the statistics in this report that reports mm -hmm. investment scams as – is that what you're referring to? That is what I'm referring to. And well, let me ask you this first. You read this report using the definition of investment scam that's utilized in this report. Is it your understanding that um, investment scams are the largest, or by far at least the most, by the largest by revenue of any type of cryptocurrency scam? Let me know if I botched that. I believe, again, this is going from memory, not reading off the report, but okay. memory serves that they did report investment scams as the highest volume and romance scams being the most damaging uh, per individual victim, I believe that was those two qualifications were in that same uh, reference within the report. Okay. How would you? Um, what's your understanding in terms of how it's utilized in this report of what an investment scam is? Um, it, it's a very wide spectrum from individual token offerings being minted and presented as an investment opportunity that uh, those behind that scheme then quickly exit the opportunity with investor funds, it's called a rug pull, uh, all the way down to the other end of the spectrum to conducting some of the schemes we've identified and discussed today where I manipulate you into a cryptocurrency investment that is either fraudulent or intended to uh, abscond with your funds that, that you are purportedly investing in a cryptocurrency. This report addresses um, pig butchering separately. It doesn't treat it like an investment scam, right? I would not want to testify to the contents of the report with that level of specificity. Okay. It's a lengthy report that I review, but I don't uh, – make those types of uh, very specific analyses from the report. Thank you. 
Can you look at page 87 of the report? Before we move on, uh, Ms. Townsend, let's yes. take a short recess. Oh, um, of course, Your Honor. Recess until uh, 11.30. We'll come back. During the break, you're not allowed to talk to anybody about your testimony. Yes, sir.
actually did need this form. Yeah, I don't need it now, unless you're not going to do any more exhibits. I just don't need it for now. Yeah. I know what the, okay, what the great. status is. I have a clean copy. Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I think I was just Oh, no, you know what? It was behind this. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I don't have much more left. I think that's probably good news for everyone. Um, can you take a look at um, Exhibit E, which is tab six, I believe, which is the report that we were talking about earlier? I used the break time to find the section that I was looking at, and unsurprisingly, it's entitled Scams. So if you turn to page 86 at the bottom. Yes, ma'am. Um, you see the graph in the middle of the of the page there? Yes, ma'am. And that is the amount of yearly, that reflects the amount of yearly crypto scam revenue, a decrease from 2021 to 2022 from 10.9 billion to 5.9 billion. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? Of the decrease? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Can you look at the next page, page 87? Yes, ma'am. And there's a graph in the middle of that page that lists the top 10 crypto scams by revenue in 2022. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Um, the top being the hyperverse.net, do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what kind of scam is that? I did not investigate or research the individual scams, so I could not testify to that. Uh, do you have any reason to, to doubt the representation in the paragraph below that graph that states all 10 of 2022's top scams were investment scams, which as a category dominated overall scam revenue last year? I do not have a reason to doubt that. Um, if you look at the next page, page 88, I just wanted to flag this for you. It, it indicates it's a guide to the scam categories we track. Does this reflect um, a distinction between romance scams and I investment scams, for example? This analysis does, yes. And does it treat uh, pig butchering scams as a form of romance scam? Yes, it does. You testified earlier today that um, in your view, and I'm going to paraphrase because I'm just going on my notes, so if I get something wrong, feel free to correct me. But I understood your testimony to be that the vast majority of FTX consumers didn't demonstrate a high level of sophistication because they fell for, I think the term you used was investment approach. Can you explain what you meant by that? Uh, what I was trying to explain with that my response, as I remember, was to a question about digital asset and crypto technical sophistication. If Does that reflect what you're getting I, at? I, I understood you to be testifying that you thought FTX consumers, debtors, customers in particular, were, I think the term you used was less technical um, and the rationale I think that you gave for that was that they fell for an, an investment, they gave up their keys in connection with an investment approach and I was hoping you could explain what, what you meant by that. So what I mean by that, I, the word fell, I don't know if... I don't think you used that. Sorry. Okay. But. Um, when asked the question about technical sophistication of a crypto user, generally users who participate in an exchange are not by nature and by default the most technically sophisticated because an exchange is designed to be an easier and less manual way to participate in cryptocurrency 
offerings and, and operations. The technical aspect of how an exchange works requires that you are surrendering your private keys to the eventual wallet that your investment goes into because the exchange holds omnibus accounts and uses the entirety of funds for different business processes. And by nature of that, they need your keys, they need the keys to that wallet that receives your funds. As a general rule, the more technically sophisticated and security conscious uh, crypto user will have a cold storage or maintain possession of their keys at all times. And I think the second part of that is my uh, assessment of that is based on, was based on, is based on mm -hmm. FTX, their, their marketing approach that specifically uh, highlighted an ease of use and a, a not requiring a high level of technical acumen with digital assets or cryptocurrency. I see. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, is that to say that in your view, someone who uses an exchange is, strike that, let me ask it this way. In your experience, is it common for an individual who is a novice in investing in cryptocurrency to hold, say, more than $10 million in an exchange? Can you repeat it one more time? Sure. In your experience, is it common for an individual who is a novice when it comes to cryptocurrency uh, investing to hold, say, $10 million or more in an exchange? I wouldn't call that common based on the amount of crypto involved. I mean, that's a very high volume. So, you know, our investigations don't involve individuals with one holding of that amount in an exchange. Just to make sure that I'm focused on what piece of the piece of piece of my question, um, would you expect for a person to have that that an individual with to have that volume um, of investment in an exchange if they had no experience in cryptocurrency? I wouldn't expect it, but I wouldn't be surprised by it. They're, they're individuals, high net worth individuals, uh, is got into cryptocurrency offerings at a very quick pace and were caught up in the uh, promise of cryptocurrency in many circumstances. So it, it's not a common practice, but it would not be unheard of. And in your experience, have you ever known a individual um, cryptocurrency investor who is a novice, new to cryptocurrency, with $10 million or more in a, in a single exchange? Have I had personal experience with those circumstances? Correct. I have not. You testified earlier about, I believe you called it, um, I may mischaracterize this, the mental state of individuals who, um, of, of, strike that, let me restart, be a little clearer. Um, you testified earlier about your views as to general mental state of individuals who, who may be c customers of debtors whose names are redacted in this case. Um, do you think it's fair to say that individuals who's, who, who have money potentially tied up in this bankruptcy would be more cautious of investment and other types of scams moving forward? I think that's a possibility. 
in your experience, has being the victim of some form of cybercrime, let's say, uh, made people more wary, more aware, more cautious of potential future scams? Yes. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Any other cross? Redirect? And there's a short redirect. Mr. Sheridan, do you recall the line of questioning from earlier by Ms. Ms. Sargassian, counsel to the U.S. Trustee, regarding moving assets to cold wallets? Yes, sir. If FTX moved customer funds to cold wallets, does that mean that those customers don't necessarily have other cryptocurrency in hot wallets elsewhere? It does not. And so customers <coughs> being, so a customer can be targeted with respect to their crypto or fiat currency completely unrelated to the fact that FTX moved their assets to a cold wallet in these bankruptcy cases? Yes, sir. Not only could their other assets be targeted, but their profile could be used to facilitate further uh, criminal schemes. In other words, if an individual is identified and a known cryptocurrency investor, it is possible to identify uh, and use their identity to perpetrate other schemes leveraging that information. And if I were to stipulate to you here today that the FTX editors have moved or are in the process of moving all their cryptocurrency to cold wallets in these bankruptcy cases, does that change your conclusions at all as set forth in your declaration? No, sir. Right. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down the street. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I think that uh, concludes the evidence, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so I think we can move to argument. Um, I will address first. Um, Before we move to argument, um, Your Honor, I just want to have a clarification. There was an affidavit that was attached to the motion of the um, ad hoc committee of an individual whose name was redacted. They have not introduced that person as a witness. So I just want to clarify that that declaration will not be part of the evidence at this hearing. It is not. It's not, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I, similar clarification with respect to the declaration of Philip Stevens, which was also attached, um, I think, as part of the hearing, Your Honor. Just to get this on the record, Your Honor, David Wendell and Eric Sheds, we are not seeking to introduce those with the evidence submitted by the committee and certain limitations of bringing an individual here without the protections of hiding their identity, uh, we did not move forward with those and we're relying on the evidence submitted in court today. All right. Thank you. That's not, that declaration is not in evidence either. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Brian Gluckstein, Sullivan and Cromwell, on behalf of the debtors. Your Honor, by the joint motion that was filed by the debtors and the committee, the movements jointly seek to extend the period by which customer names should be redacted from public filings in these cases unless voluntarily disclosed by those customers. And Your Honor, we submit, and Your Honor's heard evidence, of two independent bases to do so. Section 107, uh, Your Honor, uh, will recall um, that under Section 107, uh, an order was entered in January that permitted the redaction of addresses and email addresses of the debtor's creditors and equity holders who are natural persons on a permanent basis, but limited the redaction of all customer names and uh, customer names and names, addresses, and emails of institutional customers for an initial period pursuant to Section 107B1 of the Bankruptcy Code, subject to extension. The basic premise of the court's January order was that the debtors um, was that the debtors' customer lists, including names and contact information for both individuals and institutional customers, are an asset of the debtors' estates and a potential source of value for creditors. 
Mr. Kofsky, the debtor's investment banker, testified again yesterday before Your Honor that that value remains today. In fact, Mr. Kofsky testified that the debtors are actively running a process seeking to determine how to maximize value from the core exchanges of FTX.com and FTXUS through a variety of structures that could include their sale as assets or reorganization. The testimony yesterday from Mr. Kofsky was clear that as the debtor's investment banker, the customer list containing 9 million names is a significant portion of that value in any scenario, including even the possibility of selling the customer list with or without other assets. Mr. Kofsky explained that the customer lists are attractive assets for competitors and operators of other exchanges and also explained why third parties would, in his view, pay the debtor's value for them. Mr. Kofsky further described the analysis that he and his team did and testified that, in his view, immediate disclosure of any names from the customer list, individual or institutional, would harm the debtor's efforts to maximize the value of their assets. The conclusion of Mr. Kofsky is that a critical component of the strategy to monetize the debtor's assets is the continued confidentiality of the debtor's customer list. This testimony was unrefuted by the objectors and amplified further the testimony that this court credited in January in issuing the prior order authorizing redactions of customer names. Your Honor agreed in granting the original motion that a customer list is something that is available to be protected by Section 107D as a trade secret and that the debtor's customer list in this case met the standard. Nothing has changed about the nature or confidentiality of the debtor's customer list since that January hearing, and we submit they remain protected by Section 107D. The debtors are in a position to realize value from these customer lists and exchange assets in significant part because the customer names have been kept confidential to date, and the debtors should be permitted more time to complete that process. As Mr. Kofsky further testified yesterday, it is not yet clear at this point whether the disposition of the customer list will take place before or in connection with the plan process. Nonetheless, guided by the Court's prior ruling, the movements have only requested at this juncture to formally extend the protection of redacting all customer names under Section 107D for an additional three months from entry of an order, although it is possible, particularly based on Mr. Kofsky's testimony, that a further extension may prove ultimately necessary. The movements have been continuing to seek to strike the correct balance to ensure the protection of their assets and customer information. A continued redaction of names is, in our view, appropriate to maintain that value. This is consistent with the Court's prior ruling in January and prior rulings of this Court, including in the Craig case. Neither the U.S. trustee nor the media objectors have offered anything new in opposition to the relief requested under Section 107D. They offer no evidence, and their briefing merely recycles arguments that this Court rejected in January and has been disproven by Mr. Kofsky's testimony. The objectors here have no economic stake in the outcome of these Chapter 11 cases, and there is not a single creditor or customer who has opposed the relief requested in the motion, despite it being the customers who face the risks, both financial and personal, from the forced involuntary disclosure of their names. The objectors continue to cite the general principles of the right to public access of records and bankruptcy disclosure requirements, but have not provided evidence of any specific harm being suffered that requires the disclosure of names and institutional addresses immediately, nor do they recognize, seemingly, the Court's role in being able to modify those requirements for cause shown, as the Court did with the prior order in January. As the Court and all parties in interest have been able to observe, the debtors have been able to efficiently, effectively, and completely administer these cases while redacting customer names and preserving the integrity of the customer list. Notices have been sent, pleadings have been served, claims bar date procedures established, all with the parameters of the relief obtained in the January order and requested today to be extended. 
Your Honor, we also submit there is no basis, as suggested in the objections, for the court to carve out selective portions of the debtor's customers from the redaction order as suggested. The somewhat arbitrary request by the media objectors to reveal the debtor's top 50 creditor lists or top 50 institutional customers would actually require disclosure of some of the most valuable names on the list because those are the customers with the largest account balances as of the petition date, as Ms. Joukowsky discussed yesterday. We submit that we've inflicted a disproportionate amount of harm on the asset value of the debtor's customer list, and the media objectors cite no support for imposing any such conditions. Similarly, the United States trustee requests certain exceptions for insiders of the debtors and when customers would be identified in filings in other capacities. The U.S. trustee likewise offers no justification for these carve-outs, pursuant to Section 107B. The U.S. trustee ignores that the debtors file under seal unredacted versions of all filings, and the U.S. trustee has that information to seek court approval, as permitted by the order, of any individual names it thinks need to be disclosed. Indeed, the debtors themselves, we have already addressed any legitimate concern on this issue by generally disclosing the names of former directors and officers who, are, who might have been customers but have been publicly identified, such as Mr. Bankman Freed and his inner circle. Second, the U.S. trustee offers no legal basis for drawing a further distinction and compromising a portion of the customer's list to be determined uh, protected information under Section 107B. The debtors in consultation with the committee have determined that continued redaction of customer names for all purposes best protects the customers from being identified and poached, and there is no justification presented to put those names into the record of the Chapter 11 cases in any capacity. We submit, Your Honor, that under Section 107B, the objections to the continued redaction of the customer names pursuant to that statute should be overruled. I'm not going to address the substance of Section 107C. I'll leave that um, for the committee's counsel to address. Um, but I will just note, Your Honor, from the debtor's perspective, that we agree this relief is appropriate under the circumstances. Mr. Sheridan's testimony confirms that the disclosure of individual names will expose those customers to a very real risk of harm. It's precisely the type of harm that Section 107C is designed to protect against. I think Mr. Sheridan this morning further amplified the uniqueness of the situation presented by these cases, which we have discussed before Your Honor previously. If granted, Section 107C would permanently seal the individual customer names separate and apart from the relief sought uh, under Section 107B. Finally, Your Honor, we do address in our briefing um, debtor's position that the court can and should continue to permit the redaction of names and addresses of individual creditors, creditors who are non-customers but who might be protected by the GDPR and to the extent to Japan uh, based on a review of the plain statutory language as set forth. If the other relief is granted as requested in this motion by the movement, this is mere incremental relief impacting individual non-customer creditors in the protected jurisdictions who are most likely employees. There is no need, in our view, to deviate from the long-standing practice in this district to permit redactions to comply with the GDPR to ensure that the debtor avoids the risk of substantial fines or, the more, or more in local jurisdictions. The concern, Your Honor, here is not one of making a finding of whether local data privacy laws or U.S. bankruptcy law trump. On the facts of this case, again, assuming, I'm just making the assumption for purposes of argument, the other relief is granted. We're talking about a very narrow uh, set of additional relief. Um, and the concern, of course, is that irrespective of any findings of this court, that authorities in those local jurisdictions would seek to take action uh, against the debtor in this case. Um, as a result, Your Honor, we would ask, uh, based on the, the language set forth in the papers, uh, that, uh, that that small incremental relief uh, be granted as part of the package requested today. Um, with that, Your Honor, 
subject to any questions, uh, I will turn it over to the committee to address 107C. Thank you. No questions. Bill Barely, good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Ken Pasquale from Paul Hastings for the creditors' committee. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Your Honor, this court previously recognized at the prior hearing on these issues that Section 107C contemplates sealing individual customer names, among other types of personal identifying information. Um, and the court referenced, as does the statute, Section 1028D of the Criminal Code, which specifies that type of personal identifying information, including names. Um, so there's no question that 107C provides the court with the authority to grant the relief requested in the joint motion. Now, to be clear, um, and I, I say this in, in hearing some of Ms. Sarkeesian's questions, the requested relief in our proposed order under 107C is to seal individual customer names. It is not to seal creditor names. And in fact, creditor identities who are not customers have already been disclosed by the debtors in the schedules. Your Honor, the evidence before the court today is persuasive and completely uncontroverted that there is a significant risk to debtors' customers if their names are disclosed. The debtors' customers, in this case. This is a crypto bankruptcy case. Mr. Sheridan testified about harms to crypto bankruptcy customers in this case. Not about other cases, not about non-crypto cases, nothing to do with what we are discussing today. The objecting parties, Your Honor, quite cavalierly dismiss the risk of harm faced by the debtor's individual customers, saying it's not undue risk, it's just risk that everyone faces. In their objection, the media parties in particular appeal to, quote, common sense as the basis for many of their positions. But common sense, whatever their view is of that, is not evidence. And neither the, obje the media objectors nor the United States trustee have presented any evidence to your honor to contradict Mr. Sheridan's opinion and the proof in the record. Your honor, just, just one example of that is the, the experience in the Celsius bankruptcy cases. Um, we heard questions today, and it was argument raised in their objections, that, well, there's no proof that anyone fell for those scams. Well, no proof that people did not either. And the mere fact that they occurred, I mean, just the, dismissing that risk, um, I find troubling and insensitive. Once the genie is out of the bottle, Your Honor, you can't put it back in. And the risk will remain should names be disclosed, as occurred in the Celsius case, to, to those customers forever. That's a very significant risk. That is undue harm on the record before the court. Mr. Sheridan's testimony demonstrates that, that the risk to FTX, cryptocurrency exchange customers in particular, is significant given the nature of these cases and given the nature of cryptocurrency. Here, disclosing the names of the debtor's customers would enable malefactors to match the name with the value of the, that customer's assets on the exchange. That information has already been disclosed on the schedules anonymously. And so those who want to take the time, and as in Celsius, we know people will do this, can match the names with the value on the exchange very much akin to if a person's identity um, was disclosed with, with their bank account holder. And as Mr. Sheridan explains, that would cause uh, significant harm to those customers. It would enable a malefactor to have that additional information to use the dark web and, and other sources um, to identify and target those individuals. Further, Your Honor, it's, it is illogical and completely unsupported, again, no evidence presented, 
for the media objectors to argue that crypto customers are particularly savvy and would not likely fall for any of these scams. Well, as Mr. Sheridan testified, if that were the case, the data wouldn't be what it is. We wouldn't have the volume of losses in the crypto space as a result of such schemes. Further, as Mr. Sheridan noted, and we all know publicly, that FTX marketed to the mass market advertisements during the Super Bowl a couple of years ago and the like, which, as we cite in our reply papers, with particular focus on how easy it is and how you don't need to know anything to invest in cryptocurrency. There are approximately 9 million customer accounts. Certainly, those are not all savvy investors who would not be subject to the types of scams that Mr. Sheridan testified about. Finally, Your Honor, our burden on this motion is not, as the objectors contend, to show that there must be certainty of undue risk. That's not the law. And, in fact, no support is offered in the objectors' submissions in that regard. To the contrary, in the Access to 2019 Statements case, the Delaware District Court on an appeal held, quote, Section 107C references risk. An assessment of risk is forward-looking, while a specific potential harm must be identified. The standard does not require evidence of injury having occurred in the past or under similar circumstances, close quote. That's 585 Bankruptcy Reporter 733 at 751. The debtors in committee on our joint motion have more than met our burden of proof, showing the specific potential harm that the debtors' individual customers face from disclosure of their names. Avoiding that harm, Your Honor, keeping that genie in the bottle, far outweighs the policy of open disclosure in these cases, in these circumstances. And, Your Honor, I'd be remiss without noting that on Wednesday of this week, Judge Shannon held in the Bittrex crypto bankruptcy case that the sealing of creditors' names, individual creditors' names, was appropriate under both 107D and 107C, and finding as to 107C that the crypto industry's primary purpose of allowing immediate, instantaneous, and effectively untraceable transfers of value differentiates it from other industries and gives rise to more material risk of loss and injury to creditors. The same rationale applies here, Your Honor, and we respectfully request that the joint motion be granted. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. David Wender on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee of Non-U.S. Customers. And, Your Honor, I'll be brief. As required by the bankruptcy rules, the Ad Hoc Committee was required, its lawyers were required to file a statement that named address and holdings of its individual members. The Ad Hoc Committee filed this motion to seal and redact that information, anticipating, hopefully, that the debtors would file their motions, which the joint motion was forthcoming. We joined in that because we seek the same relief. And in hearing Mr. Gluckstein's arguments and some of the questions already, is it to ensure that a situation we not voluntarily filed the 2019 required by the code, that our requirements to file 2019s, we actually supplemented earlier this week with new members, are similarly protected such that our members and even other customers who join other committees or might be obligated under the code to submit information are not forced to disclose information that's both valuable to the debtors, that could generate value for recoveries later, and that would disclose personally identifiable information of themselves and, in fact, as a testimony, potentially their customers. And so I think that under both 107B and 107C, the filings of the Ad Hoc Committee, for example, disclosing under 2019 and similar required filings, not voluntary disclosures of who we are, should be similarly protected. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. I can say good afternoon, Your Honor. Again, for the record, Julia Sarkeesian on behalf of the U.S. Trustee. 
the debtors seek authority to redact from all papers filed or to be filed with this court the following information, three categories. Number one, the names, addresses, and email addresses of all customers, whether they be natural persons or legal entities. Number two, the names, addresses, and email addresses of all creditors, be they customers or not, or equity holders that are natural persons if they are citizens of the United Kingdom, the European Union, or Japan, and are covered by the EU or UK General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, or certain Japanese laws. And the third category are the addresses and the email addresses of customers and other creditors or equity holders who are individuals regardless of their citizenship. Your Honor, that last piece of it, Your Honor, did grant that in the order of January 20 on a permanent basis. The other two categories were just for 90 days, and we are now back with a motion that the debtors then, excuse me, the movements, the debtors and the committee filed in April to extend, well, the motion is to extend the categories for another 90 days, but there's a little bit of a conflict because part of what they propose in the order is, on the one hand, it says 90 days, but for customers who are natural persons, there's another paragraph, paragraph three, that is a permanent redaction of their names. So paragraph two says it's for 90 days. Paragraph three says it's permanent if you're a customer who's a natural person. My understanding, what was explained to me as well, paragraph two relates to 107D and paragraph three relates to 107C. The order just needs to be, regardless, if Your Honor is going to grant it, it has to be clear whether it's permanent or for another 90 days. That's certainly what we would ask, that it be clear. The documents that would be subject to these redactions include documents that are the core of a bankruptcy proceeding that any debtor who is seeking bankruptcy protection must file, including the creditor matrix, statement of assets and liabilities, statement of financial affairs, claims register, proof of claims, disclosures of professionals, such as the professional's connections with parties and interests who may be customers, and then, of course, the Bankruptcy Rule 2019 statements, as well as affidavits of service and many other documents. It is black letter law that bankruptcy proceedings must be transparent, and that transparency requires that pleadings that are filed are filed on the public docket and viewable by creditors, other parties and interests, and the public in general, unless certain enumerated exceptions apply. And again, this is especially true for information that's on, say, the schedules of assets and liabilities, as well as the statement of financial affairs. And very important on that statement of financial affairs is the transfers within the one year that the debtors made to insiders. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later. But right now, except for Mr. Bankman-Fried's name and a few, you know, three or four of what the debtor believes is his closest associates, the rest of the names of insiders who were customers, be they individuals or be they institutions, have been redacted. So the grounds that the debtors assert, excuse me, the movements assert for their position, there's three. To the extent that persons or entities are customers, they view their names being released as the equivalent of a customer list that has value either to sell or as part of a reorganization. And then separately, under 107C, as to those customers or creditors who are natural persons, I just want to get clarification here. I'm sorry. The counsel for the committee say that you are not seeking to redact the names of creditors who are natural persons if they're not customers? Under 107C. Right, if they're not customers. Under 107C. Okay, you are not seeking that. Okay. And that is based on, that is based on the idea of identity theft, based on the name coupled with the fact that they are a customer of FTX or were a customer. And then third part of it is those customers or other creditors 
who are natural persons and are citizens of either the EU, the UK, or Japan and are covered by a, a foreign privacy law that the movements believe prevent their, dis or the movements argue prevent the disclosure of even their names, although they have provided no expert testimony whatsoever to interpret these foreign laws. So going through each part separately, the value of the customer list. On direct, Mr. Kofsky testified that the customer list has value both in a 363 sales scenario or reorganization. On cross-examination uh, conducted by counsel for the media objectors, he testified that while he did not know if the debtors' customers use platforms of competitors, that to the extent they do, that would degrade the value of those customer names. Mr. Kofsky also acknowledged that the customers have not been able to use the debtor's platform since November, since this case filed, and testified that the longer that the, the platform is dormant, the more of the value of the customer degrades due to the fact that they may be using a competing platforms. Now, while Mr. Kofsky may not be aware of how many of FTX's customers use competitors' platforms, the declaration of Mr. Sheridan, which has been admitted into evidence and submitted by the debtors in the committee to support their motion, states in paragraph 25, quote, it is my understanding that a vast number of the debtors' customers use other online platforms or exchanges to hold digital assets, e.g. Coinbase, MetaMask, et cetera, close quote. Now, with respect to a reorganization situation, Mr. Kofsky testified that he believed that the customer list would have value in that situation. And on my cross-examination, I'm sorry, excuse me, on cross-examination by the media um, parties, he testified that he had not conducted any survey or analysis to determine whether the customers would want to stay with the debtors and use their platform if and when the platform ever becomes available again. Now, in my cross-examination, I asked Mr. Kofsky why he believed that FTX customers who have had their accounts frozen for now six months and potentially more than a year by the time we get to the plan stage, plan solicitation stage, with no access to their cash, not just their crypto, but no access to their cash or their crypto, would continue to be customers of the debtor in a reorganization. And he, Mr. Kofsky's testimony in response was that, well, one of the reasons is that, he, that the um, customers would be getting shares of the reorganized debtor, although he admitted that that was not a certainty. But he also passed, testified it's possible that the customers would be getting stock in lieu of being paid in full for what was in their account at the time it was frozen. And there is no way to know at this point, it would be sheer speculation, that these customers, having their assets frozen for so long, would want to continue to be customers of a reorganized debtor based on the fact that they might be getting stock potentially in lieu of getting their cash and their crypto or some portion of the cash and the crypto that was in their account. Now, with respect to 107C, Mr. Sheridan testified that if the FTX customer accounts are in cold wallets, which we know from Mr. Ray testifying multiple times in this court that all or almost all at this point, I think it's all, of the customer accounts are in cold wallets, and the customers have no way to access those, those accounts. Mr. Sheridan testified in that situation, they could not, a customer could not be subject to having the cash or the crypto in their FTX accounts stolen or, or not you know, transferred over to them in any fashion because the customers, they, they can't be subject to a scheme to transfer crypto or, or cash from an account that they have no access to. Now I do understand, again, that he had uh, testified or, or in his uh, declaration said that the vast majority of these individuals also have accounts on other platforms, and I, I understand that it's possible that they could be subject to some type of a scam to access their funds on those other platforms, although again, having been 
um, as Mr. Sheridan testified on cross, having been subject to essentially a scheme or something very bad happening at the FTX case, that they might be more cautious going forward with other schemes that could be um, pushed on them with respect to cryptocurrency. Well, just because they're in a cold wallet now doesn't mean a scammer could easily contact them, as was done in <clears throat> Celsius, or identifying themselves as counsel to the debtor, saying, uh, we, need your, we need your keys. We need, you know, we, know, we need to get access to your wallet so that we can make sure when the time comes, we can release it to you. And they give it to them. And now the scammer comes back to the bankruptcy court and says, hey, that, those assets are mine. I got the keys. They gave them to me. I'm the one who gets that money when, when the time comes to distribute it again <coughs> under the platform. Well, Your Honor, I, I guess maybe I misunderstood. I understood that from what the witness said that in platforms like FTX, that the individual doesn't actually have access to their keys, that it's kept by FTX, and maybe I maybe I misunderstood that. I don't think he said that, that, that they don't. It's a, he, he said that might be, they might have given them to him. It doesn't mean they don't have access to it themselves as well. Okay. They might have given them over to the debtors to say, here's the access to our keys, but I still have the key too. I'm not just going to give it to you. You can see how much I know about cryptocurrency, although I have to say at this point I'm actually very glad <laughs> that I know very little, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, well, I'm sorry. I wish I knew more without having invested. Let me put it that way. I'm happy that I knew so little that I was too scared to invest. Um, so, Your Honor, I think the Celsius situation is obviously very unfortunate, and of course, um, everybody wants to avoid that type of a situation. But I think, you know, we have very, very sophisticated counsel in this case, representing both the debtors and the committee, and I feel very confident that they could come up with a way to, you know, prior to, if Your Honor was to deny the motion, prior to um, unredacting any information that, you know, the, the debtor could communicate with their customers in numerous ways to make sure that they are aware that these types of things are possible and to be on high alert and to, you know, sort of have a protocol that, you know, nobody, anybody that asks for your information, it's not legitimate other than this method. And the method is there's going to be a bar date set with this court and you're going to get, you know, in the mail, a bar date notice, a proof of claim form. And, you know, I'm sure there are other things that can be done to, um, again, I'm, you know, there are a lot of sophisticated attorneys here. I'm sure there's a lot of things that could be done to, to put out, um, you know, it could be news releases even, um, to warn people so that everybody is on high alert. Um, you know, does that mean that there's not going to be one person that, you know, that might happen to? No, of course, Your Honor, we don't we don't know that. But I well, think there could be many, and there could be even if you're on high alert. I'm I'm aware of very sophisticated law firms who've been scammed. It happens. It doesn't matter how sophisticated you are, how much you're on alert, it can still happen. And, and we all get things every day. We all get emails every day that if we clicked on them and clicked on the link, bad things would happen. I mean, unfortunately in this society, everybody needs to be on high alert all the time. And, and I mean, Your Honor, I take your, your, I take your point, of course. Um, but I think that things can be done um, to, to have that extra level of protection. Um, but the, you know, I think in Celsius, I'm assuming there was nothing sent out before this happened. I know something was after it happened, they sent out notices. But with hindsight now, we know that this is a possibility we could take steps beforehand to protect, which, were, which wasn't done in Celsius, you know, because probably nobody thought this was a possibility. And I understand some of those scams were, were quite sophisticated. Um, again, it was a very, very unfortunate situation. Um, I also want to mention in this connection, the ad hoc committee's objection makes an argument that it was in paragraph 27 of their reply, I'm sorry, the reply, not the motion, that if you know that a corporation is a customer, so they're trying to you know, argue why the, the corporate customer should get protection effect under 107C, I believe is what they were trying to argue. Now, of course, 107C does not apply to corporations. It says right there individuals. But they said in their reply that, well, if you knew who the corporation was, you could somehow get access to their employees, be able to scam their employees. Now, Mr. Sheridan, I think, made it clear 
in his testimony, no, I wasn't, I wasn't talking, no, you can't get to the employees. You could get to the customers of the customer. So in other words, FTX's customer, if you knew who, who they were, you could maybe get to the customers of the customer, who might be other corporations, depending on what the, what the business is. I don't think there was any clear testimony, honestly, Your Honor, maybe I just didn't understand it, as to why it would be any easier to find out the customers of some of, of a corporation that's a customer of FTX versus any other corporation, frankly. I, I did not think there was clear testimony on that. But again, no matter what, 107C does not apply to anyone who's not an individual. I understand the argument about the customer list being a valuable asset, and we've separately addressed that, but 107C simply does not apply to corporations. Now, I'd like to talk about foreign law. The movements say they are not asserting that foreign law should control over U.S. law, but what they're asking the court to do is effectively that. They're asking the court to redact information, much of which is required by the debtors to be filed publicly in bankruptcy cases. Again, schedules and statements of financial affairs, creditor matrix, where the professionals are required to disclose as part of their retention applications, arguing that it should not be disclosed for those citizens who are, so those individuals who are citizens of these foreign countries because there's a foreign law, and that under that foreign law that they could, the debtors could potentially, potentially be fined. The effect of that is you are giving precedence to the final, the foreign law over U.S. law, and the debtors have not come forth with, or the movements, excuse me, have not come forth with one example of any situation in which a debtor in a U.S. bankruptcy proceeding was penalized or fined by some foreign authority because they released the names of creditors who were individual citizens of these countries. And I don't believe they haven't given any example of any other party in any U.S. legal proceeding that was penalized for doing the same. And they do have the burden of proof here, and they have failed to provide any expert testimony on foreign law, which they could have done, to support their contention that both the GDPR and the Japanese law prevent the disclosure of even the names of these individuals without, you know, without addresses or email addresses. They've also failed to provide expert testimony to support their contention that the exceptions, and there are exceptions both to the GDPR and the Japanese law that allow for disclosure in connection with legal proceedings. They have not put forth any expert testimony to support their argument that those exceptions do not apply here. They also do not explain how the debtors are going to identify which of their customers or other creditors who are citizens of the EU, the U.K., or Japan are actually citizens of those countries. In many cases, I mean, the debtors said at the beginning of this case that a lot of cases they don't even have street addresses for people. They only have email addresses. But even for those that they do have a street address, that tells you residency, and frankly, it doesn't even necessarily tell you that. It's just an address that somebody has where maybe they get mail. But even if it's their residence, it doesn't tell you what country they're a citizen of. And I recall that there was some discussion of this in the hearing in January, and then I thought that one of the reasons for this other hearing was to give the debtor time to try to figure that out, which of their customers are actually citizens. But we have had no testimony whatsoever on that issue or any explanation of how the debtors are going to determine that question, who's a citizen. Because if they're not a citizen, I can be living in Japan. I don't think I'm covered by Japanese privacy laws. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Again, we don't have any expert here to explain it. But I don't think the contention is, and I think that the laws actually state that they only apply to citizens. Now, going to the GDPR. Again, even though the debtors have the burden of proof here, the movements have the burden of proof. The motion fails to identify, and the movements have not provided any evidence 
that they have pursued any threshold assessment of the risk of penalization under the GDPR. There is, for example, no proof that was introduced that the debtors sought consent of any of their EU or UK creditors or customers, because that's, that's, that's an exception. If you get their consent, you can disclose the name. So there's been no evidence that they tried that route. In addition, and that's under GDPR Article 49.1a, the motion also fails to demonstrate that the debtors have made any inquiry with the applicable EU GDPR supervisory authority or the UK commissioner about the lawfulness of transferring the names of the EU or UK creditors to the US by filing that information in the bankruptcy cases pursuant to the requirements of the bankruptcy code and the bankruptcy rules. They could seek a permit from the supervisory authority or the UK commissioner. They have not indicated, they have not produced any evidence to show that they have done so. And particularly in light of the tenets of the legal claim exception, the exception to allow um, information to be produced in legal proceedings, and the discretion that's expressly given by the GDPR to the debtor's supervisory authority or the UK commissioner, and the strength of the American laws that mitigate in favor of full disclosure in these bankruptcy cases, these types of diligence by the debtors are crucial at this stage of the implement, excuse me, at the implementation of the GDPR and critical to the debtors' faithful fulfillment of their fiduciary duties in this case. All they do is say, here's, here's the law, there's a possibility we could be penalized. We haven't taken any steps. We, there are steps that are set forth in the GDPR. We have not taken steps to find out if we actually would be penalized by doing this. Get in the, or does the, you know, that this falls under the exception. We could go to our supervisory authority under the GDPR and get that information, go through that process. They have not gone through that process. All they've said is, there's a possibility we could be penalized without, again, ever giving any example of this ever, ever, any penalization ever happening to any U.S. debtor for disclosing names of citizens of the U.K. or the EU, let alone Japan. Now, one of the cases that's cited by, I believe, the Ad Hoc Committee in support of their argument in this regard <clears throat> is Forever 21. Forever 21 was my, I was the trial attorney assigned to that case for the U.S. trustee. They quote, they have language that they say is a quote from the transcript that quotes a uh, redaction of names and addresses. That quote is not on that page. It is not in the transcript. I did a word search. And repeatedly throughout is Judge Gross's case. You can see throughout Judge Gross talks about the addresses the addresses, that's what the debtors were represented by Kirkland and Ellis. The debtors moved, their motion was not to redact the names, it was only to redact addresses of um, citizens of the EU and also addresses of their employees. But putting that aside for the, for the foreign law, it was just addresses. They did not request the names be redacted. You read the transcript, that is clear. There is no order that was entered that allows for redaction of names of citizens of, of EU. And one can look at the, at the entire um, docket. There is no evidence that Forever 21 was ever penalized under the GDPR for releasing names. They're right in the creditor matrix. They're in the schedules. They're there. The addresses were redacted, but the names were not. Now, moving on to Japanese law. In the initial motion that was filed by the debtors in uh, it was November or December of last year, there was no mention of Japanese law. They discussed, they had a paragraph, maybe, on the GDPR. They said very little, but there was no mention of Japanese law at all. In the reply on that motion, which was probably filed in early January, there was one paragraph that referenced Japanese law there was a, with some paraphrases of some portion of it. There was no translation attached. There was no even a website given to where to find this Japanese law, nothing. At the, he, at the January 20th order that your honor entered, there's no reference to Japanese law at all. There's reference to citizens 
of the UK, to the EU that are covered by GDPR. And I don't believe Your Honor made any ruling with respect to Japanese law. So in April, the debtor's motion then referenced again one paragraph about Japanese law with no, no reference to where one could find an English translation of this law, which is, of course, relatively, it's, it's not a one paragraph law. Right? Um, so the question becomes, so what happened between Your Honor's January 20th order and now? Have they released the names of these Japanese citizens? Because if they've already released them, not for those who are customers. I understand anybody who's a customer, they have redacted that because they're a customer. But any a creditor who's a Japanese citizen who's not a customer, if they've, if, if they've released that information, they pass that in the back. If they haven't, then they've redacted it without court authority. I don't know what the answer is to that. However, again, when they put it in the motion, they did not tell us where one could find an English translation. So in the reply, the movements say that the US trustee did not engage regarding the Japanese law. I can tell you why they didn't engage. I, all I had was their paraphrase of tiny portions of it. Um, it wasn't until the reply that they filed on Monday that they finally gave us a website where we could get the law. And it's, it's quite, again, it's quite a long, you know, it's not one paragraph. Um, I'm not an expert in Japanese law, of course. I wish there was one here who is not. Um, but I look at the statute and I see an exception in 27 subsection 1 that says for cases based, there's an exception to the requirement of non-disclosure for cases based on laws and regulations, quote, quote unquote. The movements say in their reply, well, that only applies to Japanese laws and regulations, not foreign, but it doesn't say that. So again, we're in a situation where this court is asked to interpret Japanese uh, foreign law with no expert to explain it. The plain language, I think, says this can be disclosed in a, in a, if it's required to be disclosed under our laws and regulations. And it is required to be disclosed under US law. And then the movement state that the reason the court should consider Japanese laws because if they do not comply, there could be economic consequences. To that, they cite to the Japanese Financial Instruments Exchange Act of Japan. I do not have a translation. I do not have a website where to get a translation. I have no idea what that law is about. They are the movements. It is their responsibility to provide the court and other parties an interest with where to find certified, you know, correct translations of these foreign laws. And if the debtors are going to take a position that this court should consider foreign laws, I think they have to do everything possible to make the, that information available, not just the information and the interpretation of the laws. Because as we know, Your Honor, Your Honor interprets the bankruptcy code every day. It's not necessarily you just look at a page and see what it says. Um, so. We need, a, we need an accurate translation and we need to have somebody explaining um, the impact of that law and how it's interpreted and how it's applied. And we don't have any of that. Now, as your honor knows, in our objection, we said in the alternative, if your honor is going to be granting the relief requested, we wanted to have, we were hoping to have some carve outs. The first carve out has to do with information regarding insiders. The debtor should not be, be permitted to redact the names of insiders, be they individuals or corporations, on their schedules and SOFAs. And with respect to non uh, corporations or other legal entities, they should not be able to redact addresses if that's required uh, by the, the bankruptcy code and the bankruptcy rules and the, and the official forms. Um, and, and it doesn't matter, I mean, whether they're customers or not customers, whatever it is, it shouldn't make any difference. I mean, this is a case that's, I mean, about trans wrongful transfers that took place prior to the petition date to insiders. So the statement of financial affairs, you know, one of the, one of the critical pieces of it is a disclosure of all transfers made to insiders within the one year prior to bankruptcy. 
and some of the names are not redacted and other the names are. And I, when I asked why, the answer is, well, that we redacted, if they were a customer, the insider was a customer, we redacted their name. Okay, so let's, let's look at that from the, the, the legal arguments that they made. Is that protected under 107B? I mean, there has to be a balance, of course, here. And I think the balance on the information regarding insiders I think the balance is very strongly in favor, even if Your Honor feels that they, in general, they've met the requirements of 107B or 107C in general, that these can be an exception. What is the value of saying, oh, well, include in our customer list are insiders? I mean, of course, that, you know, that's not a big surprise. I don't think that that's telling anybody something they don't already know that the insiders of the company may very likely be customers. I don't think the value, the incremental value of that information is worth anything, frankly. Um, now, for those insiders who are individuals under 107C, I mean, again, the only thing you know is that their name, which as an employee, you know, if they're an insider, I mean, they're either a director, an officer, or they have some other you know, significant connection to the debtors. That information is probably already publicly available somewhere. But even if it isn't, all you're saying is the person's name and they're a customer of the debtors, which again is hardly surprising. I mean, it's not, you're not telling anybody something that's not easy to guess that insiders of the debtor are likely customers. So it, it, it's not really giving any more information than what's already out there. And when you have to weigh that with the importance of knowing who, again, publicly knowing who, which insiders received one-year transfers from this, these debtors, any, con any of those other concerns have to be overridden by that. Now, the debtors say, let's get to me taking a 341 examination list, which I, which I haven't been able to do yet, okay? Because how do you ask questions when I can't say the person's name? Your Honor, you have to understand that, and I don't know if Your Honor is aware, the schedules and statements from this case is like thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. So you have two sets. You have the set that was filed on the public record, that has ECF numbers, that has this information redacted, and then you have this other thousands and thousands of pages of information. You have to try to match it up and then Let's say I match it up, okay, this, this unredacted version has the person's name, and this redacted version doesn't have the person's name. And how am I going to conduct my question in a 341 in a way, it's public, right? Creditors can be on, I mean, they're allowed to, but they have the right, 341's a meeting of creditors. This is a public um, examination. So if the names are redacted, I cannot say the names. The record, the, the record of this very important examination is going to be, frankly, unintelligible because you don't know who they're talking about. And it's going to be, I, I, I don't even know how I could possibly do this. And again, this information is so critical. In this case, where there were these massive, there's been allegations of massive transfers to insiders prior to the petition date. This information just has, it cannot be redacted. The, the, the tiny, whatever tiny value it is to know that an insider of the debtor was a customer, or the tiny incremental information about this, this director or officer of the debtors, you know, was a customer. Yeah, again, that, that's not telling anybody anything they don't already know. And even with respect to other information, not just the one year transfers, if, for example, you know, there's transfers, there's gifts. There's a lot, been a lot of allegations about some of these gifts that were given, okay, charitable gifts. Well, who received the charitable gifts? Well, some of the names are redacted. Why are the names redacted? They're customers. Well, but you can't tell they're a customer by looking at the statement of financial affairs and it says, who did you give gifts to? You can't tell who's a customer. I mean, that, that doesn't tell you they're a customer just because they got a charitable donation. So, you know, they, they've created a problem of their, they've made their own problem, effectively. Um, nobody would have known. I mean, no, how could you know? Just because somebody gets a charitable donation doesn't mean they're, they're a customer, presumably, one would think. Um, 
So, and there's, there's other examples, Your Honor. There was a motion filed, and I, I hope I have this correct. I don't know it, that it matters that much. It was a motion, I believe, to reject executory contracts. And, of course, they have to list the names of who the con contractual counterparties are. Some of the names are redacted. Some of them weren't, and some of them were. When I asked, why are some of the names redacted, the answer was, oh, they're customers. I mean, nobody would know they were customers. I mean, there's no way to know that they were customers until you redacted the names. There was no way to know that they were a customer. This is not, I mean, it's different than I, it, with respect to the creditor matrix, I mean, there's an argument there. You, you're not creditor matrix. It doesn't say you're a customer. But the, but the debtor's argument was that the vast majority of our creditors, the vast, vast, vast majority were customers. But, you know, you have it. That certainly wasn't true with this motion. Maybe half the names or less, I don't remember, were redacted. Contract counterparties. Some of them are customers. Some of them aren't. There's no way to know if you don't redact the names. So we also think in that situation they should not be permitted to redact names. Now, there's also, there's also other situations involving the names of insiders, maybe apart from the schedules and statements, where if the debtor, if the, what you, U.S. trustee would ask again, if your honor is going to grant the motion generally, is that any time the debtor wants to redact names of insiders in, in anything, anything they file, they need to make a separate motion. It should not be a given that the names of insiders can be redacted. Um, there may be other very important filings in this case where there are reference to insiders. Um, I mean, in the plan and disclosure statement, are they going to be redacting the names of insiders because they're customers? Again, unless it's Sam Bankman Freed and four other people. I mean, so they, they, it should not be a given. If it's an insider, they should be required to take that extra step, make a motion, and then we have an opportunity and others have an opportunity to respond. Your Honor, in the Third Circuit Incendent Corporation, which is 260 F. 3rd, 183, uh, 2001, said, quote, the burden is on the party who seeks to overcome the presumption of access to show that the interest in secrecy outweighs the presumption. And I think that that is especially important when we're talking about insiders. And the purpose when we're talking about schedules and statements of financial affairs the, the purpose of requiring the debtors to disclose all their assets, liabilities, and business dealings is to ensure that the creditors have a, a reliable and accurate information that they can rely on to determine the status of the debtor's financial affairs and to trace the debtor's financial history. It's very important in this case. That's in Ray Hayes, 549-BR-677, Bankruptcy District, South Carolina, 2016. The bankruptcy schedules and statement of affairs are designed to elicit certain information necessary for the proper administration and adjudication of these cases. The balance of the rights and creditors of other parties for information on insiders against the chance under 107C that disclosure of just the names would create a, quote, undue risk of identity theft or other lawful, unlawful injury, close quote, which is from the statute. And you consider that with respect to an officer, director, and insider who may already have public information linking them to the debtors, almost, almost certainly. Again, that balance really shifts in favor of disclosure. And as to insiders who are not natural persons, the balance of whatever value they have as a customer versus the presumption of public access of, of, in, of information about corporate insiders, okay, that should be released that has to be released as well. I mean, to say we're going to redact the name of a corporate insider because they're a customer, it, it, that balance, again, is, is way in phase, very strongly in favor of disclosure. Um, just, I'm almost done, Your Honor. With respect to the ad hoc committee, if the, if the court does grant their motion, we would ask the right to, to reserve the right to later seek their names to be just their names, not what their exact holdings are or anything like that, but just their names uh, to, be, to be unredacted if they become involved in plan negotiations or otherwise take 
a larger role in this case. And the ad hoc committee said that they, quote, act in a representative capacity for the interests of all non-U.S. customers, not for their own individual benefit. Close quote. That's paragraph 18, I think, of their reply. That's a reason to disclose the names. I mean, I think non-U.S. customers have the right to know who is claiming to represent them. I mean, right now, as far as I know, they have not had a large role in the case. But if they step up and their role becomes greater, just like Your Honor said, the names of the committee members, have the, the um, un, members of the Official Committee of Unsecured Creditors, those names have to be released. And if you're, and if you're a corporate uh, committee member, your address has to be released as well. Your Honor had already ruled that previously. Similarly, if the ad hoc committee takes a larger role, we would like, again, the opportunity, we don't need a ruling now, but the opportunity to be able to argue later that that information, the members' names, should be released for the same reason that the, the committee's um, information was released. And actually in that regard, just one thing, the, the proposed order, um, the proposed order that Your Honor entered on January 20th had a provision stating that the names of the committee members had to be could not be redacted. They had to be released on the top um, 50 list or whatever the number was in the top creditor list. Um, that was that was actually that is not in this order, this proposed order. So we would certainly ask that that be, we would want that to be clear that those names, just like Your Honor previously ruled, that that would continue to be um, the case. And just in conclusion, Your Honor. You know, one thing that the debtors argue is that, again, the movements argue is, well, they're only asking for another 90 days. Although, again, there's some of it they're asking permanently for the customers who are individuals. They want that permanently. But the, they say, oh, but otherwise it's just for 90 days. But it's already been six months. So another 90 days, now we're at nine months. And debtors' counsel indicated they might ask for a further extension. So, um, you know, we're... we're it's been a long time for this information to remain redacted. Um, so, you know, again, Your Honor, we believe that the movements have not met their burden of proof, but especially, again, with respect to information relating to insiders or customers or, or non-insiders in the context that one could not tell they were a customer from the context of the disclosure. We think those exceptions can be made, and we think there's a reasonable and important basis to make those exceptions if Your Honor is inclined to otherwise grant the motion. Unless Your Honor has any other questions, my um, argument is concluded. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about anybody else, but I need a lunch break. Uh, so we're going to let's recess until uh, we'll say 1.30. We'll come back at 1.30. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.
Good afternoon, Your Honor. Katie Townsend on behalf of the media interveners, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg LP, and the Financial Times. I think it's important to address um, at the outset the applicable burdens, as well as to address, I think, why the media interveners are here in the first place. Though I think it should go without saying, I'll say it anyway, uh, the shared interests of the media interveners here is straightforward. They're news organizations, and they want to report on what is undeniably a newsworthy bankruptcy stemming from the massive collapse of a prominent cryptocurrency platform. That collapse sent shockwaves not just to the cryptocurrency industry, but the entire financial industry. And at this point, we don't even know where those shockwaves, both individually and institutionally, have hit the hardest or what institutions may have the largest or no exposure as a result. That is a compelling and legitimate interest that the press and the public have in the names of the creditors, also customers, um, in these Chapter 11 proceedings. And it's a particularly salient uh, point when we're talking about the top 50 unsecured creditors. That distinction is not, I think it's, as has been suggested, an arbitrary one. Um, the top 50 creditors are those institutions and individuals who have the most exposure, have, have been most affected in this bankruptcy proceeding. So I think so. so the let me ask you a question. What are your clients going to do with these? If I say the names have to be, be released, what are you going to do with that information? I, you know, I can't speak exactly to what my clients would do with it. I assume that the reporters would review that information and they would use it to report on exactly what I, what, what I, exactly what I but said. But if all I give are the names... What are they going to do? They're going to go, first thing they're going to do is go try to identify who the people are, right? Well, Because they're not going to report that somebody named Mr. X, who lives in Shanghai, um, had uh, a lot of money invested in FTX uh, uh, tokens unless they verify that information. And the only way they can do that is to try to figure out who he is. Who's Mr. X? Well, if we're talking, Your Honor, about, let's say, the top 50 creditors, let's say we're talking a lot about, we're talking about some institutional investors. Um, so in cases like that, I think my clients probably would ask for comment or attempt to evaluate what the impact, potential exposure of that institution, which again could have broader financial impacts. There are also individuals who, frankly, my clients would think would be important to report on. If Jamie Dimon, for example, someone whose views on what investments are good investments to make, has a lot of exposure in, in, in from his, let's say, and again, I don't know, this is just a hypothetical, um, has some, uh, is one of the top 50 creditors of FTX. Would that be newsworthy? Would that be important for the public at large and people who may consider Jamie Dimon's investment moves to be one they would want to follow? Is that relevant? I think so. So would my clients report on it? I wouldn't be here if my clients weren't didn't think it was important to understanding the entirety of not just what's happening in this bankruptcy proceeding, but the impact of FTX's collapse to understand who was potentially hurt the most. I think I think they, we do think that's important, and that's why I'm here. Um, so I think the attempts to paint the news media's motives to inform the the reader, its readers, and the the public at large about what's happening here as somehow illegitimate as wrong, it is wrong and I think it should be, it should be treated as such. Um, that said, the media intervener's motives um, aren't really relevant uh, and it isn't the media intervener's obligation or any of the objector's obligation to demonstrate specific harm from a failure to disclose that information it's not our evidentiary burden, um, as has been suggested, to demonstrate that we have some other interest beyond an informational interest in that information. The starting point is, as Your Honor knows, the presumption of public access under the First Amendment and Section 107 of the Bankruptcy Code. Transparency is the rule. It's the default in all bankruptcy cases, including bankruptcy cases in the cryptocurrency context. So the debtors, the official committee, the ad hoc committee, they bear the burden to demonstrate with evidence, not speculation or conjecture, that all of the information they want to redact falls within the scope of either Section 107B or 107C. Um, I want to start with Section 107B, which, as Your Honor knows, 
um, permits the protection of an entity with respect to a trade secret or confidential research, development, or commercial information. This is a statutory, a narrow statutory exception. It's been interpreted to apply uh, to information that's critical to the operations of an entity. Um, and in order for the uh, exception to disclosure to apply in 107B, the disclosure of the information at issue must reasonably be expected to cause the entity commercial injury. We understand why the court at the second day hearing would want to take an incremental step to seal the names of FTX's customers and creditors, all of them, for 90 days, a time period that we understand was calculated to maintain the status quo um, while the defend, uh, d debtors rather explored potential valuations of their assets. But it's now been more than a month since the expiration of that original 90-day redaction period, and the debtors haven't given this court an additional basis to conclude that the names of approximately 9 million customers fall within the definition of commercial information and warrant continued redaction. The parties are continuing to rely on the testimony, solely on the testimony of Mr. Kofsky, which he supplemented yesterday with respectfully little more than he gave this court back in January. In fact, I think the debtors and the official committee seem to concede that there isn't much more to say at this point. According to their own joint motion, they have yet to determine how they're going to utilize what they call their customer lists. They assert that the names of FTX customers are a potential source of value, but being just a possible source of value isn't enough. And even assuming that it was, the record doesn't establish that disclosure of the names of FTX's customers or any subset thereof would destroy that potential value. Um, so Mr. Kofsky maintains that the debtor's customer base or maybe even just the customer list itself could have potential value in a restructuring or sale, but he has yet to provide any testimony as to what he thinks that value actually is, that specific value, and he hasn't given us any real world examples of what value, if any, has been ascribed to a list of names of customers standing alone or otherwise in other cryptocurrency transactions, for example. Um, moreover, the primary concern that Mr. Kofsky has identified, the poaching or potential poaching of FTX's customers by competitors, we think is particularly misplaced in this context. We're not talking about some list of exclusive customers. As the counsel for the U.S. trustee pointed out, the official committee's own witness, Mr. Sheridan, testified that a vast number of the debtor's customers use other online platforms or exchanges to hold digital assets. In fact, he testified that it's common for cryptocurrency holders to use multiple wallets or online platforms to store their cryptocurrency assets. So simply put, whether or not one or more of the nine million or so customers with FTX accounts moves to a competitor or is poached by a competitor, assuming they were not already using a competitor platform, which they very well may be, that may have nothing to do at all with whether or not that customer also will continue to use FTX's platform after some restructuring in the event it continues to exist. That determination is likely to have a lot more to do with how that customer feels about FTX rather than how it feels about some competitor because it's not an exclusive relationship. Nor does the evidence, I think, support a conclusion that it's reasonably to be expected that a competitor could or would effectively use this list of names to attempt to poach customers. So Mr. Kofsky testified yesterday that he um, directed his team to locate through Google, Facebook, or Twitter some mechanism, including through those platforms themselves, like a Twitter direct message, some way to contact the top 200 customers of FTX, and they were able to do so for fewer than half of them. And he testified it's, he thought it was highly likely uh, that they identified the right person for only 34% of them. Um, he didn't testify as to whether there was any effort to, to actually validate the results of those that experiment by determining whether or not they had in fact located accurate current contact information for those individuals that they had searched for. Um, but even his sort of 
best estimate of whether or not they had done a good job was only 34%. That experiment, one that I, it's based on a not representative, um, and I, I think a conceitedly not very scientific methodology, fails to establish that FTX's customers could be expected to, or could or would effectively operationalize the names of customers um, to, to debtors' disadvantage. <coughs> Moreover, I think even if we assume that Mr. Kofsky's testimony, which is all this court has in front of it, was sufficient to establish that the names of all of FTX's roughly nine million creditors who are also customers fall within the scope of Section 107B, there's been no showing differentiating between different subsets. I think there was a, the suggestion that Mr. Kofsky testified that the top 200 creditors would, that those names would be the most valuable, but Mr. Kofsky didn't draw distinctions between specific values for specific subsets of customers. So there's no showing that a small subset of that 9 million, say the top 50 creditors, would constitute confidential commercial information that if disclosed would damage um, in a serious way uh, a, whatever p potential value that, the, that that set of names might have. I think debtors at this point have had, and, and the moving parties at this point have had, an ample opportunity to attempt to meet their burden to demonstrate these names are in effect in a, a, a primary or, or um, critical asset uh, to their business, that there are extraordinary circumstances and compelling need that warrant, frankly, the extraordinary level of secrecy that they're asking this court to impose, um, and they have not met that burden in our in our view. And our 107B, um, and we would respectfully urge the court not to extend the redaction deadline um, on that basis. With respect to 107C, this is the provision, as your honor knows. Um, that permits the court to protect an individual with respect to the following types of information to the extent the court finds that disclosure of such information would create undue risk of identity theft or other unlawful injury to the individual or the individual's property. As an initial matter, Section 107C applies only to the names of creditors, customers who are individuals, not entities. It's right there expressly in the statutory language I don't believe that either the debtors or the official committee, uh, from what we can tell, unlike the ad hoc committee, suggest otherwise and take the position that it should apply to the names of entities. Um, but for what it's worth, the ad hoc committee offers no case law to support this sort of expansive view of Section 107C as applicable to entities, the names of entities. So I think any argument here, Your Honor, regarding the application of Section 107C should be understood to be relevant only to those creditors, customers, who are individuals, who are natural persons. As to those customers who are natural persons, I do take issue with the suggestion I think that's made, been made a number of, of times today that media interveners are being dismissive of potential risks of harm to individuals who may be targeted or maybe the victims of cyber crime. The media interveners aren't being dismissive. I think we're being, frankly, realistic. Um, Certainly, as we, we, we don't dispute Mr. Sheridan's um, testimony that criminal actors like cryptocurrency, it's a means and a method for them to effectuate crime. Uh, at the same time, um, in from there, there, as he testified, his testimony suggests there's really no limiting principle to the notion of who can be targeted and who can be a victim of these crimes. Um, he provided no evidence to demonstrate that current cryptocurrency or known cryptocurrency users are more frequently the victims of the various online scams that he testified about, or even that they're more frequently the targets of those kinds of scams. And as he testified, unfortunately, online attacks and cyber threats, stalking and bullying are endemic in today's virtual world. And it's not just in the cryptocurrency context, but bankruptcy proceedings in general have information about creditors who may have a significant amount of money tied up in a bankruptcy, who may be vulnerable for that reason. To the extent we take this 
argument to its logical conclusion. We're effectively flipping the presumption of access in bankruptcy proceedings on its head. So I do think that there are ways, and again, we're not dismissive of these risks. I think the position that we're taking is that any restrictions on the public's rights of access here need to be narrowly tailored, and that there are alternatives to redacting the names of all of the customers or a subset of those customers, and those alternatives can include things like the types of notices, advance notices, that were sent to customers involved in the Celsius case after the fact. We now have the benefit of the unfortunate incident that occurred in the Celsius case. We can preemptively, or the court, counsel, sophisticated counsel representing all the various parties in this case, can preemptively inform interested parties this is a potential risk, that they should be wary, mindful of these kinds of scams. So there's a benefit to what happened in the Celsius case that can be translated here to help potentially just alert people to the potential risks that may be out there. There's also just the fact that even if these individual customers were not savvy or aware of the potential risks or of investment scams, they are now. And as Mr. Sheridan testified in his experience, individuals tend to become more wary of scams when they have already fallen victim to one. And I want to emphasize too, Your Honor, I think the evidence, it's difficult because we don't know. We certainly don't know, but there's also been no testimony about the types of individuals and parties can speculate as to whether or not they're sophisticated or not sophisticated at different sort of levels of investment in the FTX platform. I think as Mr. Sheridan testified on cross, I think when we're talking about the top 50 individuals with multi-millions of dollars invested in cryptocurrency, I don't think we have any basis. Certainly there's been no evidence to suggest that they're novice investors in the cryptocurrency context, that they don't have the means or wherewithal or sophistication to attempt to protect themselves from what, again, are unfortunately ubiquitous, I think, attempts at cyber crime. And particularly, I did want to emphasize too a point that I think Mr. Sheridan made in his direct about the cryptocurrency industry generally. Being a higher risk investment when it comes to making an individual sort of more susceptible to or a more, let me put it this way, a more desirable target potentially for criminals. He indicated that the cryptocurrency industry doesn't provide the sort of traditional level of protection that other financial industries have. And I just want to note that we've talked about the customers as sort of one big group, but certainly customers who, and particularly customers who are sophisticated investors in cryptocurrency are well aware of those risks. They're aware that they're investing in an industry that doesn't have those same protections, an industry where cyber criminals may be more interested in cryptocurrency assets than other types of assets. And so, again, this isn't to sort of diminish or minimize any risk of, or any harm that a victim of cyber crime suffers when they have cryptocurrency or other assets sold, but I think, or stolen, but I think to the extent we're talking about very sophisticated investors, when they invest in a risky type of cryptocurrency investment or they make a risky investment, they understand all the risks that are, or we have to assume they understand the risks that are attached to that investment. I won't spend much time on foreign law because I think counsel for the U.S. trustee covered that quite well, but I think just to reiterate, and thoroughly, just to reiterate media intervener's position that I don't think we need to even be talking about the GDPR or the content of any foreign law because public access 
to judicial records filed in this bankruptcy proceeding is governed by the bankruptcy code, the bankruptcy rules, the First Amendment, and related US law that mandates access or presumes access. Um, I think the debtors and the official committee's reliance on section 105 to argue that the court should take some additional precautions with respect to um, what they argue might be the potential application of foreign law is, is a concession, frankly, that neither section 107B nor section 107C apply here. And I would emphasize that that Your Honor noted in the January 11th second day hearing that the court would need evidence, expert testimony, something to address the foreign law issues in this case. The debtors, the ad hoc committee, the official committee have all had the opportunity to present that evidence and haven't done so. Um, so we would, we would state or restate as we have in our briefing that we don't think foreign law is any basis or any influence on what the court's obligations are with respect to access to the records that are filed in this proceeding. And finally, Your Honor, I just want to um, put this in a little bit of, of, of context because I think one of the things that is most striking and frankly most problematic about the arguments that are being made for redaction in this case is the lack of any limiting principle. I think the debtors, the official committee, and the ad hoc committee argue at times expressly for a rule that would apply in all cryptocurrency bankruptcies, not just this one. We've heard repeatedly, this is a cryptocurrency case. Much of Mr. Sheridan's evidence turns on, again, the appealability of cryptocurrency to would-be criminals and bad actors. Um, I don't think the, 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 the notion of a, of a per se rule um, that permits redaction of all creditors who are also customers in the context, or who are individuals, to be clear, under, un, um, uh, under 107C, but all creditors or customers under the 107B context, um, a per se rule that would uh, permit redaction of all of the names of those creditors, customers, in every bankruptcy case involving cryptocurrency, I think is deeply troubling. Um, and I don't think that, the, that there's been any evidence to suggest that FTX, this, these Chapter 11 proceedings are different in some sense or some way than other bankruptcy proceedings with respect to the arguments that are being made by the parties. And if you have no further questions for me, Your Honor, I will conclude my argument. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gluckstein, what exactly, I just want to make sure I understand what the debtors want to have sealed at this point? Are we sealing all customers? Are we sealing customers and creditors? Are we sealing, what are we sealing? What are we asking to be sealed? What is at issue today, specifically, is the following things. Number one, the sealing of all customer names pursuant to section 107B We've requested that for an additional period of 90 days. That includes all names, for all purposes, individuals, institutional. Number two, an alternative argument made under section 107C. That argument would re would re is requesting that the court grant the authority to grant, uh, to, to redact on a permanent basis, all individual customer names. If that relief is granted, that is obviously supersedes the 90-day period with respect to the individual portion under 107B, but they're completely separate legal standards, of course, Your Honor. But it does not moot it because we need the request with respect to the institutional customers to preserve the entirety of the customer list for all the reasons Mr. Kosky testified. Those are the primary relief that's, that, that has been requested. If that relief is granted today, while there was a lot of focus on an objection from Mr. Arkazian, the incremental relief, if we think about the entirety of the picture of what's contained in the motion, the incremental relief under what's being termed a foreign law question, 
would only be non-customers, individual non-customers. The names of those individual non names and addresses of those individual non-customers uh, who would be protected by the GDPR, the Japanese privacy law. And as I represented the court in my argument earlier, if we put all those pieces together, we believe that there's a very limited set of employees in those jurisdictions who are not otherwise customers on an exchange. That's what we're talking about. Your honors order in January already authorized the redaction of individual addresses of customers on a permanent basis. The U.S. trustee did not object to that. So the question, the question before the court is dealing with the names of customers, which is a, a contentious issue, as Your Honor has heard over the course of the last two days, and the names and addresses of institutional customers that are on our customer list. Um, and we have obviously taken the customer list question and the monetization of that incrementally, as as your as your honor guided us in, in giving us the initial three month period, and we have asked for the extension for all the reasons Mr. Kofsky uh, testified about yesterday. The 107C issue, of course, redaction of customer names, and again addresses are already uh, of individuals, individual customers' names under 107C. Again, the address is already permanently redacted. That is a permanent request, and that is new evidence, entirely new evidence that we had not put before the court in an evidentiary way that was supported by Mr. Sheridan's testimony and his declaration. Okay, thank you. Um, just a few points on the specific uh, arguments made, if I could, Your Honor, in your role. And I think, and I think it's helpful, and I appreciate the court's question on focusing what we're actually talking about here from a relief perspective. The other thing I think is important for us to step back and focus on is what are we asking? We are not asking for some per se rule that applies to all types of cases. We're not asking for some per se rule that applies to all cryptocurrency cases. Your Honor has been presented with evidence uh, with respect to the facts of these cases. Your Honor is also well aware from over overseeing these cases since November of the complexities that this case, these cases present, the sheer size of these cases, and the issues, uh, many of which are novel, presented by, uh, by these Chapter 11 cases. With respect to 107B, Your Honor, there's no carve out in Section 107B for media outlets who might want to report on high profile people uh, that might be on our top 50 or top 200 or top 9 million predator list if the information is protected by the statute as commercial information. The, uh, Mr. Kofsky did testify yesterday, despite representations made today, that the top 200 creditor list, top 200 creditors on our creditor list, he testified very clearly in the course of doing his analysis, represents over $2 billion in claims. There's a very significant value represented by that top 200 creditors that some subset of which the media objectors are asking uh, to be uh, be disclosed. Mr. Kofsky also testified very clearly in response to questioning for, on cross-examination that his, his opinion as the debtor's investment banker is that there is value to the customer names irrespective of whether the customer has an account on another exchange or not. And more importantly, or as importantly, I should say, the, whether the debtors are going to try to reorganize re or restart the dot-com exchange or sell the customer list as either on its own or part of a set of assets is still to be determined, as Mr. Cox just testified. And his, the premise of his testimony, based on the process that's being conducted now by the debtors, is that competitors, third parties, have value, see value in that customer list. So they're going to put whatever value they put on that list, and they're going to do whatever evaluation they're going to do as to whether those customers 
uh, whatever analysis they might be able to do about whether and, and risk adjust for those customers being on other exchanges or whatever they might do. But at the end of the day, Mr. Kofsky's clear testimony is that his view as the debtor's investment banker is that there is value available to these estates by preserving the confidentiality of the customer list. And that's the argument that we've asserted under Section uh, 107. There was suggestion about, well, we can solve lots of problems if we just give notices, we give more notices. And I guess that starts to get into the 107C issue some. I'm sure Mr. Pasquale will have something to say on that. But as the court observed during the course of the hearing today, there are certainly limitations to noticing. I, I don't think anybody would, would suggest that you're sending out a notice to people who are going to solve these problems uh, from that perspective. Um, with respect to uh, the foreign law issues raised, again, this is you know this is ancillary to the relief as we've presented it. Yes, we have not brought foreign law experts to interpret those statutes. I think the the term was just used in argument by the Media Objectors Council. Um, that that relief, that incremental relief is somewhat precautionary. That is how we've presented it. We don't, until very recently, that would not have been controversial in this district. Mr. Sarkeesian talks about how we haven't, no, we haven't presented a case where there has been a bankrupt, a, a debtor that has been um, sanctioned under these circumstances. Uh, until very recently, the U.S. Trustee's Office didn't object to this relief. And in fact, we cite in our reply papers a string side of cases, including cases by Your Honor, where this relief with names and addresses um, was routinely granted. And we understand, um, and, and we understand that there are issues presented and issues that courts have begun to grapple with with respect to whether some of these foreign statutes um, would uh, take precedence over U.S. bankruptcy law issues. I don't think, though, Your Honor, under the circumstances that precludes this court, in the context, again, of everything that we're doing here, we, if, if, if Your Honor agrees with the movements that we are going to be redacting and have and, and, and is appropriate on the facts of this case to redact the customer list, to redact the customer names, um, we submit that the, the, the risk that is presented by the plain language of the statute that we don't need an, an expert to testify about is enough to grant that incremental relief. But it is certainly very much ancillary um, to the relief um, we're asking for today. And finally, Your Honor, just in response, because there were suggestions made or intimations made by Ms. Sarkeesian, um, the debtors have complied with the court's January order through the letter of that order. So we have not made redactions into Japan or any other law that's not covered by that order. Um, and so I just want to be clear about that. We have, we have obviously, that order was an evidentiary hearing to get that order uh, put into place. There was negotiations over the language in that order, including with the U.S. Trustee's Office, and the court entered that order in January, and that order remains in place. That was a final order on our first day motion, um, and the motion we're asking for today is uh, obviously um, uh, incremental to that. Just Ms. Sarkeesian's argument <clears throat> that the debtors have redacted the names from other pleadings of customers. We have redacted names of customers from, I don't, I think, the, the, I, I don't know if the pleading. You raised the contract rejection motion. So. That the names were redacted and that was because the debtor said, well, they were customers. Uh, we have redacted customer names. And I don't know that that was in the motion itself. I think this mainly occurs in things like affidavits of service and the like. Um, but we have redacted customer names mm -hmm wherever they have appeared. Um, we, we have done that after consultation with the creditors committee. Um, we, we do, you know, it has been our position that customer names um, should be redacted, that that, we, that, that has been done, uh, that has been authorized. And so we have, in order to assure that customer names are not in the public domain on the docket of this case in an involuntary way, we have redacted um, those names wherever they appear. Well, here's, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the issue. If, if in fact there was a motion to reject contracts, 
that included the names of the part the counterparties to those contracts and the some of the names of those counterparties were redacted because they're also a customer of the debtor that's problematic because no one would know that they were a customer of the debtor unless you redacted them they wouldn't know because they're already redacted from the customer list so you can't redact a name from a motion when they're a counterparty to a contract I'm using that as an example I think one of the other ones you used was charitable donations parties who receive charitable donations um, you can't just redact their names because they also happen to be a customer because again nobody would know that they were a customer so I, I, I don't I don't recall the contract rejection motion this is referring to and I don't recall offhand whether that was in the is the scenario that your honor is positing this issue arises mostly in the context as I say of things like affidavits of service where we're serving uh, people who are in capacities that where they also might be customers uh, things like that uh, but your, your I, I understand your honors your honors point um, and we obviously will take um, you know we obviously will proceed forward with um, any guardrails that your honor imposes on us no okay. right. thank you thank you afternoon your honor Ken Pasquale for the committee just very quickly I think I've addressed in my prior comments and in the committee's pleadings most of the points that were raised in opposition to the motion but just two things if I may um, first with respect to the notices that might go out as Ms. Townsend said quote after the fact we shouldn't have to deal with after the fact attempts to correct uh, information when it when it is disclosed uh, that's the genie example I mentioned earlier once the names are out no matter how much warning we give people um, the, the harm can be done as Mr. Sheridan testified um, council also argued that customers accepted the risk attached to an investment in cryptocurrency yes as an investment in cryptocurrency they did not accept the risk of an involuntary uh, this, excuse me of involuntary disclosure of their names in a bankruptcy case that they didn't expect to happen um, and certainly didn't accept the risk that such a disclosure would expose them to again as Mr. Sheridan testified that's all I have yeah, yep. thank you, thank you. Okay. If it'll resolve the issue. Sorry, Your Honor, for the record, David Wender on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee. And just to explain the, the discussion before, there was a little bit of back and forth with Mr. Arkeese and myself as to where the language came from in our pleading. Um, we referenced the transcript that actually was incorrect. It's in the order where we got that quoted language from. Um, Mr. Arkeese rightfully pointed out based on it wasn't in the actual transcript. There's history. I was not involved in that case, but we got the language from the order. I don't think that's essential for today, but I just wanted to clarify that it was coming from different places and neither one of us were attempting to mislead the court. Now, Your Honor, you asked uh, Mr. Gluckstein what he wanted and it, since we also had our separate motion, I wanted to answer that question on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee. But our motion was filed. First of all, we joined the, the relief requested by, in the joint motion because we think it's appropriate to, to protect customers. With respect to the Ad Hoc Committee's motion, it was to protect the disclosures in the 2019 statement to redact customer names and addresses. Ad hoc committee members are non-US customers and that information is also to be protected. The reason why we seek it both under 107B and 107C and relying on the evidentiary record is, is, is a little different because in 2019, and it's, if you looked at the actual redacted 2019 that's on the file here, it lists redacted form name, redacted form address, but it also disclosed their economic interest, which is required under 2019. 
including in certain instances where they had records of actual traceable cryptocurrency. And so, and, 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 and the reason why I'm, I'm wanted to focus on that and, and talk about one, um, 107C, again, under 107B, the debtors in, in, in the joint motion say they want to protect their customers because they might be able to obtain value from it. So 107C and people focused on it, well, it only protects individuals, and that's what it references. But if you actually look at the language of 107C, is protects an individual if the disclosure would create undue risk to individual or the individual's property. And this, the property we're talking about is, it's, again, investments of these entities, and some of them, it's, although there's no evidence, but I'll just say, or single person LLCs, but their property would be put at risk. And if you look at the individual, and if you look, uh, again, at 107C, it references 102D7 of Title 18, or, or sorry, 102D of Title 18. Um, subsection seven of that says, any name, it talks about the information protected, any name or number that may be used alone or in conjunction with other information to identify a specific individual. And by having this information, we heard the testimony about the ability to trace on the blockchain and the dark web who owns and who's involved. We think 107 would apply, whether it's to everybody, maybe that's it, it, since the joint um, motion isn't seeking that relief, but we think relative at least to the 2019 statements that that would apply to protect, to, so we don't have to come back in 90 days to reseek. Now, again, we said this in our pleadings without prejudice to the United States trustee to come and seek disclosure. That, that reservation is always there for her. But so what, we're, what, the, what the ad hoc committee is seeking for is, is, a, is an order clarifying that, other, that, we, that when we file our 2019 statements, the ones that are, have already been filed, we may redact the names and addresses of our individual, of our customer that are both individuals and non-individual members of the ad hoc committee. What does the ad hoc committee intend to do? Uh, we are hopeful to be engaged in the process, sir. Um, we've attempted at, at one point earlier in the case, we talked about an official committee that didn't go anywhere. We're trying, hopefully, and it's early stages, um, to hopefully, although not in a representative capacity, because we're not, but ensure that, and although there is an unsecured committee, we think that there are certain aspects of the unsecured creditors committee cannot fully represent non-US customers. And so we are hopeful that we will be involved in the process. Um, to what extent, we'll see. Um, to, to hope that there's a plan that we can, as a voice and someone who can speak to non-US customers can say, we think is in the best interest of all non-US customers as well, and support that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Um, well, here's what I'm going to do. With regard to the redaction of customer names under 107B, I think the evidence presented was uncontroverted that customer identification has value, has value to the debtor's estate. And under 107B, the customer names constitute a trade secret, as I said back in January. Um, and as a result, those uh, names can be continue to be redacted for an additional 90 days um, while the debtors continue to seek how they're going to come out of these bankruptcies. Are they going to sell the assets, including the customer list, or are they going to reorganize, in which case they're going to want the customer. The fact that the customers might not be exclusive customers, and I don't, some of them might be, some of them, I mean, we've got 9 million customers, I mean, that's a lot of people. Um, I have no way to parse that. I don't think anybody has a way to parse that out. Uh, so the the best way to uh, deal with the issue is to say that all of the customer names can continue to be redacted. Um, the 107C issue. Um, Mr. Sheridan introduced uh, very compelling testimony, again, uncontroverted testimony, about how customers can be identified just by a name. Um, it's something that happens all the time in our society today, given the access to not just the types of information we all have access to, Google, Twitter, et cetera, but the dark web, um, where there's all kinds of information about individuals that can be found with just a name. And uh, he testified, again, very compellingly, that if they have the name and the fact that they are an FTX customer, they can be targeted. And that is the, what we need to protect here. 
it's the customers that are the most important issue here. I want to make sure that there are, they are protected and they don't fall victim to any types of scams that might be uh, happening out there. So I'm going to uh, grant the motion as well to redact customer names under 107C for individuals on a permanent basis. Obviously does not cover companies or entities. On the foreign law issue, I simply have no evidence um, to support it. I know that as uh, Mr. Gluckstein pointed out, I've entered orders in the past, but it's always been without when there was no objection. But there's an objection now. Um, and it's the uh, right of the U.S. trustee to write that objection. So uh, I needed to have something to show that there would be harm to these individuals who might be located in the U.K., the European Union, or Japan that would result in some harm to them. And I have nothing. Um, the, the statute itself, at least the GDPR, um, is not exactly clear to me. I mean, it says they have to be protected, but um, I, I, I really, as I said in January, I would have liked to have had someone come and testify and tell me that if you order the release of these names, uh, the debtors are subject to uh, some kind of sanctions. Um, I find it hard to believe that a court in the UK or the European Union or Japan uh, would say, I'm going to sanction the debtors for releasing names when they were ordered to do so by a court in the United States. That just doesn't seem to be a potential possibility. So I'm going to deny the motion to that extent. On the 2019 uh, issue for the ad hoc committee, this is a, a horse of a different color. You have an ad hoc committee who wants to participate actively in the case. As with the as I said with the uh, members of the uh, Unsecured Creditors Committee, if you want to be a member of the Unsecured Creditors Committee, you have to identify yourself uh, because people have a right to know who they're litigating against. And they can't do that if they don't know who they are. Uh, so I don't think that they are protected under 107C or B. And those names have to be disclosed if they're going to participate. Now, I understand um, that you may have had some of your clients sign up for this with the expectation that I would keep that information sealed. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to go back to your clients and say, uh, the judge said we can't seal these names and information, so we're going to have to disclose it. Do you still want to be a member of the committee? Uh, so that they can have the chance to withdraw if they want to. All right. So that motion is denied. Uh, any questions about that one? Yes, Your Honor, I do have a few questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, for the record, Juliet Sarkis on behalf of the U.S. Trustee. Um, how about redaction of the names of insiders who happen to be customers? Is your ruling, does your ruling allow them to continue to redact the name of insiders on Statement of Financial Affairs? And other For now, yes. Okay. They're, they're subject to the 90-day to the rule. Even if you cannot determine from the document that they are, in fact, customers? I mean, well, I'm... The debtor can only redact them if they are a customer, so we're going to have to, if the debtors are, are redacting names of insiders who are not customers, that would be a problem. No, but I, I didn't hear that they were doing that. No, you're, I'm sorry, I misspoke. What I mean is that if you looked at the document and from the context of it, okay, it here transfers to insiders, from the context, there's no particular reason to believe that anybody is a customer or not a customer. Well, that kind of goes back to the, what I was talking to Mr. Gluckstein about, Gluckstein about with regard to the charitable donations and the right. uh, the motion for uh, assumption or rejection of contract y you can't you can't redact a name in a in some other motion where they are a party to that motion simply because they're also a customer because as i said nobody would know they're a customer i agree with you on that right so your honor so if in the statement of financial affairs when we look at the transfers to insiders there's nothing to indicate there's no way to know if any of those insiders are customers. So given that fact, is Your Honor ruling that if you cannot tell, looking at the Statement of Financial Affairs, that these insiders happen to be customers, that they would have to disclose those names? Yes, they do. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and just final question, Your Honor, on the redaction of customers who are individuals, their names, is that on a permanent, Your Honor, is that, is that on a permanent basis? Under 107C, yes. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, real quick, 
Patrick, I apologize. David Wender on behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee. In, in following an unredacted 2019, is it just the names that have to be unredacted or the addresses as well? Because um, under 2019, we have to disclose them. It provides for the name, the address, and the disclosable economic interest. I think everything has to be disclosed under 2019. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. That brings us to the main event, I guess. Everybody's been waiting for it. Uh, I'm going to rule on the application or the motion by the JPLs to lift the automatic stay. Um, I was thinking about this lying in bed at 3 o'clock this morning trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this mess. Um, and I was thinking, what is the most important thing here? What do I have to consider? What is the most important thing to consider? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little trouble with my voice. The most important issue in this case is what's in the best interest of the customers and the creditors. Because that's what this case is all about, getting value back to the customers and the creditors. And that should inform all of my decisions, uh, and particularly this decision about how to whether or not to lift the automatic stay. So what are the issues involved here? And it's, it's a tangle of issues here. We have who are the customers and whose customers are they? Are they customers of FTX trading or other US debtor entities or are they customers of FTX digital media, uh, the Bahamian entity? Are the assets at issue held by the US debtors or the Bahamian debtors? Uh, are they held in trust? for the benefit of creditors? Or do they belong to the estate, the various estates? If the assets are FTX Digitals, and I make that conclusion at some point during the course of this case, are they subject to clawback as fraudulent conveyances? And those are issues that also have to be decided in this case. Where are the assets located? Are they located in the US, which gives me in-rem jurisdiction over them? Are they located in the Bahamas? which gives the Bahamian court in rem jurisdiction. As I said yesterday, I am not going to defer to, and I would not defer to any other court, the question of what constitutes assets of the debtors in the cases before me. Uh, and contrary to uh, Mr. Shore's colorful argument, it's not based on the fact that the Bahamas don't have nuclear weapons. Uh, I would do that even if it was France, as I think he referred to. Um, so the question then is, so you know, where can that relief be granted? Um, this is the only court that can grant complete relief regarding the assets that are under the jurisdiction of this court that relate to, that are being held by the debtors in these cases and that are subject to the question of how to allocate them. Do they allocate, do they all belong to the US debtors? Do some of them belong to the uh, Bahamian debtor? Uh, at this point, I don't know. That's an open question. Of course, that this issue about in rem jurisdiction uh, begs the question that the assets that are held in the Bahamas, um, the Bahamian, court, Bahamian court has control of. They have in rem um, so how, and that court could make its own decisions about how those assets are to be distributed. Um, and they could complete, and the Bahamian court could say, we don't care what the US court decides. In fact, I think that's what the JPLs argued to me on the first day of this case. Judge, we don't care, it, the court in the Bahamas isn't gonna care what you do. They're not gonna, they're not gonna enforce any of your orders. Well, that might've been an overstatement. That's what was said. So what, what you know, puts me in an awkward position, obviously. Um, I certainly would have no basis to order the Bahamian court to do or not do anything. I can't, I have no control over that court and what they decide to do. But because the JPLs are proposing to make a filing with the court in the Bahamas, 
which, contrary to their arguments, goes well beyond merely asking for the Bahamian court to establish protocols. My reading of the application is they're asking the court to, to make decisions about whose assets are they. Are they assets of the U.S. debtors? Are they assets of the Bahamian debtors? And not just the assets that are located in the Bahamas, but all of the assets, including those located here in the United States. Um, so so the, the, uh, I got, I lost my train of thought there. So what the JPLs are, are doing is they're asking the court in the Bahamas uh, for uh, substantive relief that would absolutely have an effect on the debtors in this case. Um, so they need to have relief from the automatic stay because the assets that are here that are under the control of this court and the debtors here are subject to the jurisdiction of this court. So have the JPLs met their burden of establishing the need for relief from the automatic stay? From the evidence that was introduced at the hearing, the debtors established that there are several forms of harm as to that, the U.S. debtors. Incremental costs associated with litigating the same issues in two different courts. It's not insubstantial. Um, we're talking millions of dollars. The confusion to creditors who are trying to figure out, am I a creditor in the Bahamas or am I a creditor in the United States? And those creditors, again, I go back, first issue, is the first concern is how do we protect the creditors and the customers. Those creditors, some of them might want to uh, participate as uh, the ad hoc committee here wants to participate in the case here. Uh, are they going to have to retain counsel down there and participate in both proceedings and increasing the cost to them? And by the way, the incremental costs uh, of for the debtors to appear and the creditors committee to appear uh, in the Bahamas comes out of the pocket of the creditors. Again, everything goes back to the creditors, the interest of the creditors. And finally, the delay in the case. It's going to take time for both courts to, to litigate the issues. And I know there was some discussion about having uh, combined hearing with uh, the Bahamas and uh, this court at the same time. I'm not going to opine on that one way or the other at this point, but I will point out um, that the costs of doing that are not insubstantial either. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I was involved in the Nortel case, and I know it costs tens of millions of dollars just to set up the infrastructure to be able to have a joint hearing with the Canadian court. So we're talking about a lot of increased cost that comes out of the pocket of the, of the customers and the creditors. The only harm articulated by the JPLs that I could discern from the testimony is that they can't carry out their fiduciary duties because they can't go to the Bahamian court and ask for uh, them to decide these issues. But as the debtors pointed out yesterday in their argument, that's not the issue here. The harm to the JPLs is not the issue. It's the harm to the customers and the creditors. Um, now, and, and finally, um, uh, just to close out on the, uh, the standard for prevailing on a motion to lift stay is uh, prevailing on the merits of the underlying claim. And that, I don't have no idea at this point. I have no idea. It's an open issue. It's got to be decided. Um, and there has to be a trial if it can't be resolved. We have an adversary proceeding pending here. Um, and I know the, um, the JPLs have filed a motion to dismiss that based at least partially on the idea that it was in violation of the, the agreement between the parties on how to handle um, the, the issues between the two courts. But I would ask the JPLs to reconsider that because we can't, we gotta get this case moving. And if we're gonna be arguing over issues like that, it's not helpful. Because at the end of the day, even if it did violate the agreement between the parties, I'm probably gonna allow it to go forward unless there's some other basis for dismissal. But I, I admit I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the motion to dismiss. But if it's only based on the idea that 
um, the debtors here violated the agreement between the parties. Um, I might say, yeah, I'll slap you on the wrist for violating the, the agreement, but I'm not going to dismiss and have to start all over again. Uh, let's get the case moving. Let's get those cases moving forward. Um, so on the, again, prevailing on the underlying issues, I don't know. Um, now, JPLs are certainly free to go to the Bahama court and tell them what happened here today. Advise them of my rule. And I don't know what the Bahamian court will do in response to that, but that, again, I have no control over the Bahamian court. Uh, but that might be enough to satisfy their fiduciary obligations. At least they'll go back and say, we tried, this is how it came out, we lost, um, and we need to move forward. Now, I do believe, as I mentioned, you know, the, the in-rem issue is between assets here and assets in Bahamas. Obviously, the Bahamian court's free to ignore any ruling I make whether or not the assets belong to the U.S. debtors or the Bahamian debtors. And they can go forward and have their own here and make a ruling on how, how that's going to play out for the assets that they hold. So the case is begging for some kind of a protocol between the parties to resolve that issue alone. I mean, we're going to end up, there's a possibility it could end up with inconsistent rulings in both courts. And that might happen whether we have a protocol or not. But I'd, at least I'm going to order the JPLs and the debtors to mediate the issue. Retain a good mediator, someone with experience in the area, to come up with a way to see if there's any kind of protocols that can be put in place to address these issues. In the meantime, we're going to go forward with the adversary proceeding that I had before me. And I want to do it in as expeditious a manner as possible because we're wasting the customers. I mean, the customers' assets are wasting away every, every day we spend in bankruptcy. So let's try to find a way to cooperate and find a way to resolve these issues. So for now, I'm going to deny the motion to lift the stay. Uh, the party should meet and confer and issue a form of order under certification of counsel. Are there any questions? Your Honor, the committee would just ask to be a party to that mediation. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Anything else? Thank, thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, that, that is clear to the debtors. Um, the only other thing, just to note before we close, there was on the agenda today, which I think flows well from Your Honor's comments, initial scheduling conference in the adversary proceeding uh, between uh, the debtors and FTX Digital Markets. Uh, we have been talking with counsel for, for FTX Digital. Um, I believe we have agreed on a form of uh, a schedule to move that litigation forward, understanding they have a pending motion to dismiss, um, and of course, um, Your Honor's comments this afternoon. Um, so I think for purposes of the conference, uh, I think the update to the court is that we intend to submit that scheduling order for your honor's consideration. Um, that scheduling order um, do, is designed from the debtor's perspective to ensure that we get to a trial on any issues that might need to be tried related to those issues, um, consistent with our confirmation schedule that Mr. Dieterich laid out yesterday. Um, and I think we have a schedule to do that. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know if my comments make any difference in what that schedule is going to look like, but um, you can resubmit it under COC. Thank you, Your Honor. And Your Honor, just clarification with the committee asking as well, with the ad hoc committee now at least attempting to, could we at least attempt to participate in that mediation as well, at least as an observation party at, at the minimum? I think as an observation party, that's a good idea because obviously, as I said, um, you know, creditors might want to participate and it's going to depend on what happens in each of the two courts. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, you can participate. Too. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me throw this out too. Is there any? Are we at a stage now where a mediation of the ultimate issues is possible, 
or do the parties need to engage in some discovery first? Your Honor, I think we should, um, I should probably confer uh, with counsel for the JPLs. The debtors have been talking, try, starting a conversation with the JPLs. We're obviously very interested, as Mr. Dietrich outlined yesterday, in moving the plan process forward and having an ultimate resolution that would resolve these issues in that context. We've started that discussion, early stages. We would love to fold the JPLs into that plan process to the extent we need to resolve the litigation issues raised in the adversary proceeding. Um, you know, as I said, I think we, we are certainly hopeful to move that forward expeditiously, but I, I, we probably should confer on you know, the scope of the mediation. That might make some sense. I would, I would appreciate the parties doing that. Because I think, in my view, I mean, I don't, you, you can put forward a proposed plan, but nothing's going to happen until we know the resolution of who owns which assets. Um, you, know, you can't confirm the plan until we know who's, whose assets they are. Um, so that's, it seems like the, the front running issue here is the litigation. Am I wrong? Or well, I mean, conceptually, yes, Your Honor, but there are certainly scenarios where if we were, and this is just a hypothetical, obviously, at this point, there's certainly scenarios where if the debtors and digital markets um, as you said at the outset, because this all relates to getting assets to customers, could reach an understanding of how to make that happen, some of those questions might become less important if it was on a consensual basis, right? So there, there would certainly be ways to distribute assets in both estates, potentially, through a plan process in a consensual manner. But we're, we're, it's too early to put specifics around that, but I think the premise of your honor from the debtor's perspective is absent an agreement with the JPL on how to administer all of the collective assets, then we would need to obviously decide those issues. But if right. we had an agreement on that question, we might not need to. Right. That's that's my that's what I'm trying to get at. Get an agreement on the issue. <laughs> so, Your Honor, Jason Jake, the avoiding case for the JPLs. Um, I actually agree with Mr. Gluckstein, not on too much, but on, on a few things. One of which is, I think Your Honor's suggestion concerning the scope of mediation is constructive. Obviously, we have to consult with our clients in order to give you an official answer, but I think that's something we should consult about. Um, and absolutely agree with Your Honor's comment that, you know, absent consensual resolution, resolution of these issues, regardless of what court it's going to be resolved in, which is a separate question, but resolution of who owns what assets is going to be an issue that has to be resolved before, you know, any plan process can be concluded. So. Um, I would, we'll work with the debtors on the order. Hopefully we won't need your help on, on that one, uh, on a form of order, uh, and also consult about uh, the scope of the mediation and uh, report back to the court on whether we can have an agreed scope on that. Okay, excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Anything else for today? Your order on the, uh, <laughs> your <laughs> honor, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. On the two sealing motions, should council submit a proposed order under yes. COC? Yes, please. Thank you, or two proposed orders, two orders. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you all very much. We're adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor.